I can put the speaker on. I can do that now. <laughs> Okay, you guys, ready to go. Okay, is there anybody that would like to speak to us tonight? No. Okay. <laughs> um, we're going to be going to closed session in, with uh, 2.1, which is one expulsion referral. We almost never have any. It's good. 2.2, Certificated Public Employee Appointment, Government Code Section 54957. 2.3, Classified Public Employee Appointment, Government Code Section 54957. 2.4 negotiations update, 2.5 public employee discipline dismissal release leaves, 2.6 existing pending anticipated litigation. And there we go. We'll see you at seven. <laughs> <laughs> Come back, whatever. Hello. Hello, hola. Hola, como estas todos? Oh, my God. How good we get it? Okay. Hello, hello. Okay. Hello, let's go. Welcome. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Hello. <laughs> welcome, everybody. Welcome. <laughs> welcome. Welcome. Bienvenidos. Welcome, bienvenidos. <laughs> we are calling to order now our board meeting of November 13th, 2019. Welcome and bienvenidos. Um, we're going to do the Pledge of Allegiance and I will ask Maria. <laughs> Is, is Virginia here? Um, yes, she's back there. Okay. Okay. Para los que quieren traducciones, tenemos Virginia. Virginia, levanta su mano. ¿Dónde está? Ahí. <laughs> y se puede pedir, no sé cómo se llaman, un aparato de ella, con ella para poder hacerlo. Um, so if you would like to speak on the agenda, obviously we've got a lot of them already. <laughs> you need to <laughs> fill out the little yellow little card here. And um, each speaker will have two minutes. We're going to have quite a few speakers. Um, si este quieres hablar sobre la agenda, tiene que um, conseguir una tarjetita María y llenarlo para poder hablar y cada Persona que va a hablar tiene dos minutos. Okay. Now for the superintendent comments. Dr. Rodriguez. Okay. So well, I hope um, everyone had a wonderful um, Veterans Day. Um, thank you to the men and women um, that have served our country and have given the ultimate sacrifice um, for our freedom. So espero que todos hayan tenido Un día maravilloso de veteranos. Um, gracias a todos los hombres y mujeres que han servido a nuestro país y a aquellos que han dado el máximo sacrificio um, para nuestra libertad. So on October 31st, and so you see a picture up there, I spent the day in the life of a behavior tech at Rolling Hills Middle School with Nick Ariano in the RISE program. I chose this day because I thought it was going to be a super challenging day. 
Um, however, um, because of the great staff, we had a really calm day with very um, minimum incidents. So, el 31 de octubre pasé un día en la vida de un técnico de comportamiento en la escuela secundaria de Rolling Hills um, con Nick Ariano en el program RISE. Um, elegí este día porque pensé que iba a ser un día muy difícil, um, pero debido a todos los empleados tuvimos un día muy, muy tranquilo sin incidentes mínimos. Um, I was able to work with students and observe Nick as he expertly redirected behaviors, established connection with students, and recognized appropriate behavior. Um, we're really lucky to have Nick, who's been with our district many years and shows great dedication to his work. So, pude trabajar con estudiantes y observar a Nick um, mientras redirigía comportamiento en una manera experta, establecía una conexión con los estudiantes y reconocía el comportamiento apropiado. Um, somos muy afortunados de tener a, tener a Nick, que ha estado con el distrito por muchos años y muestra una gran dedicación a su trabajo. We also celebrated our second um, Caught You Being All In by recognizing Esther Murillo from Diamond Tech. Um, she, we surprised her at her site at Diamond Tech and brought her um, a flowering plant. Um, we're also going to give her one of our All In Every Day shirts. So thank you um, to Esther for being All In Every Day. And if we go to the next one, you'll see we had students go and be there and surprise her as well. So. Um, so, um, también celebramos nuestro segundo re reconocimiento de con ganas todos los días a reconocer a Esther Murillo de Diamond Tech. La sorprendimos en su oficina y llevamos um, una planta. Gracias a Esther por siempre estar presente y con ganas todos los días. And in closing, this is the only meeting in the, uh, um, of the board in November, so I wish to wish all of our students and families a peaceful Thanksgiving. So al, fi al finalizar, um, ya que es la única um, junta que vamos a tener en noviembre, espero a todos nuestros estudiantes y familias que tengan un día de acción de gracias um, lleno de paz. Gracias. Okay, I'm now going to have governing board comments. And I always start at the end with Georgia. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. Um, hello all, good evening and welcome everyone. I'd like to chime with our superintendent and um, thank all the men and women of our um, military services for their service and some for their um, ultimate sacrifice in serving our country. Um, it feels like it's been a long time since our last board meeting. Um, since then, a lot has happened. Um, my colleague, Trustee Dodge Jr., and I attended a local event in which Assembly Member Robert Rivas for AD30 was the guest and keynote speaker, and Trustee Dodge Jr. and I had the opportunity to have a follow-up conversation with him discussing our local public K-12 educational funding needs and our continual strive to ensure equality for all of our students in our local educational system here in the Pajaro Valley. Um, we also attended the Pajaro Valley Community Health Trust fundraising event. Education and health are two very important pillars in any community that is going to thrive. And it's important for us to remember as that we need to support these fellow community partners in their efforts in our commu local community as well. Um, additionally, I would like to also make a brief comment regarding a comment that I made at the October 9th board meeting during the discussion portion of the SELPA presentation. I made a comment regarding a situation in which I had only one-sided information from a mother of SELPA, a SELPA student, who had spoken during the public comment portion of that meeting. I was aired to speak on a topic which I had only one side story of the situation. Additionally, my comment was not meant directly to the concern of that one situation, but to the growing concern my colleagues and I have been receiving from other stakeholders within our community regarding SELPA as a whole. However, nonetheless, I was aired in speaking to a topic that I only had one side of the story. Surely if I had both sides of the story at the time to that situation, it would have been handled very differently. 
If a brilliant and intelligent mind of someone such as Bill Gates can admit and own when a situation had, should have been dealt with and handled differently, certainly I am capable of doing that as well. I would like to add that it is important for all of our stakeholders of our community to understand that my colleagues and I are mere human beings. As such, we are fallible. A district of our size has multiple stakeholders, from the thousands of employees to the 20,000 plus students, their parents, their families, the multiple thousands of taxpayers in our community. And I would never intentionally or de deliberately intend to offend any one of these stakeholders. And I actually strive to ensure equality in the representation of all of these multiple stakeholders, as I full well believe my colleagues do as well. Thank you for your time, and I wish everyone a wonderful Thanksgiving. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you, all of you, for taking time out of your day to be here this evening. Um, thank you to all of those who have served our country also, um, as I have had family members who've passed away serving our country, so definitely realize what a great sacrifice it is. Um, it's been very busy. Um, so our Safe Night to School Ecology Action Committees um, have been working with Watsonville Intergovernmental Committee and we're working on safe routes to schools. There will be changes coming up to 15 of our public schools to make routes safer for those kids to get to school. The changes will also include some changes for Landmark, Landmark Starlight, PV High and HA Hyde. Um, the changes at Landmark will also help some of the students at New School who have trouble crossing the crosswalk across Harkin Slough. Um, I was able to visit Starlight Elementary School um, for their reading program kickoff with Watsonville High School. Um, it's a wonderful event, a wonderful reading program. I was able to actually sit down and read a story to a few first graders. Um, I also attended some of the harvest festivals at our local schools here, supporting the students and all their hard work and efforts they did to put on wonderful harvest festivals along with their teachers. Um, I also went to the Dia de los Muertos event at Watsonville Plaza where they had an altar that was set up to honor people who have passed. Um, so it's been very busy. I also went to the health committee meeting and saw presentations from Fitness for Life and also Pajaro Valley Prevention Services. I want to thank Patty Mata for all of her hard work she's done at getting va the vaping ban here in the city of Watsonville. Um, also, as a reminder, kids, teachers, if you're vegan or vegetarian and you want to order lunches that are vegan and vegetarian, you can do so on the district website. You do not need a doctor's note, and those can happen any day of the week. Um, I was also able to speak with H.A. Hyde, SELPA staff, about some of their concerns and upcoming um, issues and find out how their <coughs> meetings have gone with the SELPA task force. Um, I will be addressing that later. Um, I attended a SELPA services meeting at EA Hall. I was also able to visit the Migrant Ed Make Lab at EA Hall, and I'm working with them to get them some more engineering support. Um, I attended the Aptos Sports Foundation anniversary event that honored student athletes for the Aptos. And I've also been making phone calls and meeting with some of our legislators, including those who are running for um, Congress and running for US Senate, um, dealing with our education issues that we have here and our need for fair funding in order to support our district. Thank you. I know we have a lot of folks who want to speak tonight. I'm going to just keep it to one highlight, and that was um, the attending of the Aptos Sports Foundation Gala. And, and what I was particularly moved by and I wanted to share was um, the story of Gina Castaneda, a former Aptos High student, and just her, you know, her participation in sports, you know, how that helped her overcome, you know, gang entrenchment, and that she's been taking her experiences and given back to the community through the Azteca Youth Soccer Program. And so just, you know, everybody who has been a part of our schools in whatever capacity and used their experiences to give back to the community and continue that growth and development, you know, thank you. Thank you, Karen. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us at tonight's meeting. I attended a parent community meeting at Freedom Elementary School. 
regarding the possible sports field um, in collaboration with some community partners. So I do want to thank the families and students who attended that meeting. We appreciated their feedback and the insightful questions that they had around the sports field that hopefully will be coming for board approval um, in the near future. I also attended the uh, Education Equity Blueprint meeting. It was great to see the amazing collaboration among staff developing their action plan, um, action plans to address uh, some of the student needs at their school size from credit recovery to the implementation of student-led conferences and greater access to electives among other, other topics. And yesterday in celebration of School Psychologist Week, I spent my morning with Duncan Holver staff. I got a tour of the facility and uh, walked away with a deeper understanding of the challenges that our staff are facing, but also about the many wonderful things taking place uh, throughout the CELPO department. Um, and just so that you know, for some health reasons, I will be leaving early today. So if I leave uh, during the time that you're speaking, please don't uh, take that as me being disrespectful. Um, and with that, happy Thanksgiving to everyone present and to families. Thank you. Yes, sorry. <laughs> um, hi. <laughs> um, um, I'm Stella Sierra, um, and I am the student trustee. Um, I'm from Aptos High School, and so last Friday I participated in collecting donations for Second Harvest Food Bank at the football game, and um, this is something that we do at our school, and it's sort of a part of our Interact Club, and this organization, we've been doing this for the past couple years, and we've always tried to raise money for them, and... Um, also, we've tried to make it a contest between classes, which gets students more involved. Um, so this is just like a great way for students to get involved with the community. And yeah, thank you. Thanks, Karen. Um, welcome. It's great to see everybody turned out tonight. Um, I was away for um, a couple of weeks. I have a daughter who's finishing a Fulbright scholarship over in Southeast Asia, and I um, was able to go over and, and visit her site and see her um, finish um, the culmination of a long year. And so it was very special to be immersed in a different culture, and, um, and uh, I'm just really um, proud of her efforts. Um, when I came back, I was jet lagged, but I did go to the Santa Cruz School Board Association meeting where John Laird was our fe featured presenter, and um, he's running for state senate. And I did advocate for more dollars for facilities. Um, as you know, um, our bond has um, done s some improvement in our facilities, but we need more, as everybody here knows. And so we just don't have it in our budget, so this, we're looking to the state to to try to increase our funding for facilities in the future, and John knows that um, very well. So um, between that, I did also um, advocate for increased funding just for salaries and for increased um, retirement and health care costs. So um, just know that your board is always advocating to try to get more money to come to this district so that we can retain you guys. So thank you. Um, the other thing I would just like to point out is that um, we have a number of fall sports which are um, coming sort of to the end of their seasons, and we have a lot of student athletes that have worked very hard this year. And um, as a district, we're very proud of our sports programs and for all of the coaches and the assistant coaches and the volunteer coaches and all the effort that the student athletes have um, put in over this um, semester. I just want to commend everybody and thank you all very much. Good evening, everybody. I'm glad to see everybody here. Um, I just wanted to start off saying that I want to acknowledge as a board member I should have never provided information on personal matters or matters under investigation. I have learned from this experience and I will be mindful not to discuss personal matters in the future. Um, again, I apologize. I came in as a trustee wanting to do the best that I can right away and sometimes um, I don't always follow the rules and I apologize for that. <laughs> So just quickly, um, always busy. Um, I'm always out in the community. I'm always trying to learn from everybody, trying to do the best that I can. I try to hear from you guys so I could come up and, and do the best that I can to represent you. Um, just a couple events, adult ed. Uh, Dr. Nancy Bilsich had an adult ed where a lot of us community members 
came and listened to what's going on in adult education. I attended the Veterans March, um, which was held a couple days ago at behind St. Patrick's and walked with the veterans all the way to the Vets Hall. I also just want to acknowledge Council Members Felipe Hernandez and uh, Aurelio Gonzalez from the Watsonville City Council who were you know, dedicated their time and their service in Iraq. And I also wanted to say Happy Veterans Day to all the generations of Watsonville High School Wildcats who served in World War I, II, Korea, Vietnam, uh, Iraq, and, and, Af and Afghanistan. Um, I also attended the last football game between Watsonville High and Santa Cruz, or Watsonville High 1. I, I attended the Watsonville City Council meeting where they talked about Measure G. Measure G is a tax that would allow us to keep our, all of our police officers and firefighters, so I hope you guys could um, think about and support Measure G. Um, I also attended Mini White and Hall. I checked in with them to see um, how, are thing, how everything is going with the field and their portables, and I know the district and Joe and Michelle are doing the best that they can to get these schools fixed. And I also want to say thank you, um, Esther Morillo, for all your years of dedication to this district. I was part of this district when, well, way before. Well, you started way before I was even in the school, so I just wanted to thank you for your many years of service. Thank you. Well, to me, just briefly. <laughs> um, well, I haven't done so many things that other people have done. Oh, wow. Very impressive. Um, I did go to a labor breakfast, which um, had Mark Stone there, and he was he's a really great assembly person. And um, each of us were asked to talk, but I was the last person that was going to talk, and I wasn't able to stay as long as I would have had to stay to, to be able to talk about our school district. So that was kind of a bummer, but that's okay. Um, but uh, tomorrow I'm going to go to the Migrant Head Start meeting, and then... Friday, there's going to be a really wonderful event at uh, the Elks Lodge for the end of their migrant season, which they have every year, and it's very special, special event, and people are recognized for all the work that they've done, and it's, you know, music, food, and all that stuff. It's a really great event, so I'm going to go to that, too, on Friday. Okay. We're going to do the high school students board representative report. And I think we have, unless you're going to say no, I think we have Watsonville High School, Aptos High School, and New School. Am I correct? Thank you. So we'll start with Watsonville High. Is PV High here too? Okay, you should have told me. PVI, raise your hand, PVI. Uh, there you go, thank you. I don't have a presentation from you. Or the machine will work. We're starting with Watsonville. Okay, am I on? Okay, yeah. Okay, good evening, everyone. My name is Omar Casillas. I come from Watsonville High School. I'm their representative. So, first, I'd like to start off by mentioning breast cancer awareness. Month. Uh, last month, as I mentioned before, we went to football games. We asked for donations and just whatever people could give to support breast cancer research. Uh, we had games where we would let students in where free, and we asked staff members and students to wear pink on Wednesdays and on other events. We raised over $250 in that month, and we will, we will be donating and presenting that check in the following weeks. Last month, we also had our college and career week. And we to finish it off, we had 28 schools come and visit and have a, co wow. a college fair, excuse me. And a lot of the students got to learn about different schools that we usually don't ignore, like in the area, because the U system is so dominant here. And we even had a presentation from UC Santa Cruz, which was really informative about our options and how lucky we are to have it so nearby. Last month, well, it's October, so it's Halloween. And we had a lot of students dress out for Halloween, and we even had our Halloween Spirit Week consisting of like sock and headwear day and like things such like that that people could enjoy. We had a pumpkin decorating workshop two days after school and during our food day sale, and people, students really enjoyed getting just to paint pumpkins that they could just share with the memory with their friends. At the end of the week, we had our pumpkin, uh, I'm sorry, a food day sale, and the bottom picture with Angel Garcia. Uh, is at the food day sale. We had a little like place where people could take just pictures and like enjoy it with their friends. At the uh, at the November eighth, 
uh, because November 1st, there was no school. We uh, didn't get to celebrate Dia de los Muertos closer to the uh, date it was. But on November 8th, the Dream Club, along with the, with the Spanish department, well, foreign language department, specifically the Spanish department, because they take care of culture events regarding like Spanish speaking countries, they set up the Dia de los Muertos event, which consists of like a cafeteria where they offer a free meal for fam to for students to bring their families. And the, uh, the some students put up a play along with uh, Mr. Pozo and it's always very fun and very nice to see the students in touch with their culture that they might lose being Mexican Americans or Chicano. And then we also had our senior nights. Last uh, Friday was our, our football senior night, they won. And Yay. they really enjoyed it and had fun at their last game and got, I believe one of the parents got them free dinner at Carmona's because it was like their tradition to always go to Carmona's after school. The volleyball girls, we only had four, but they really enjoyed their senior night and it was really special to them because a lot of them have been playing for multiple years. And it was like just to congratulate them for their dedication to Watsonville High School. Last month, we really focused on stress awareness, considering that stress awareness date did land on November 6th. Uh, ASB has started something called intentional planning in which we find something, we all have an idea, something that we're truly passionate about so that we can portray our best in that project. Lily Molina set up a National Stress Awareness Day. That was her event. It was a really fun day where students got to just during break, lunch, and after school play with like giant Jenga or giant Connect Four. It just kind of have like a de-stressing day. We even, we had we also had a poster which you can see in the back post and the smaller picture in the bottom, and you just stick up your stressors and like just a fun way to like identify them and have fun. Student stress is such a big thing. Like nowadays that uh, uh, colleges require a well-rounded student and it's really important to us to like help students have a great mental health we also ask that you guys uh look for more social emotional counselors considering that we only have one for a population of around 2300 you're the biggest high school the biggest high school the biggest high school we have we have miss daisy nunez and while she is amazing at her job she is only one and she can only help so many students and the time it takes for her to build the trust, find the core issue and help the student deal with that issue is just too long for her to be able to attend all the students that need the help. So we really ask that you guys take that into consideration and follow and meet the demand for social emotional counselors as long as other mental health help. Starting tomorrow on November 14th, our, the, the WHS drama pr uh, production is of The Outsiders. They did a little twist on it. They switched the genders of the role or were very fluid with the genders offered about it. And these are the dates for the play. Uh, they really appreciate support and they really like it when people go and see and like just enjoy what they've worked so hard to present. A lot of these students do stay up very late to finish their work after uh, extensive rehearsals because they are a lot of them are perfectionists and they like to just have the best production for you. So we really appreciate when people come and show up and show your support. And then lastly, November 22nd, we will be hosting a staff giving for those un un truly underrepresented uh, staff members such as our custodial staff and our kitchen staff. They are the people that stay there the latest, get there the earliest, and we really wanted to say thank you to them and show our appreciation. So we will be having a staff giving. Them and their wow. families will be uh, Them and their families have been invited to a dinner, and our ASB has uh, will have will volunteer to help the, them that day clean up so they can go home and get changed and come back to school and enjoy the dinner, and they can have a day that we're a little they're a little less stressed. Even this morning, I was talking to one of our our staff members, and he was sorry, his name was George, and he was saying how um, he was short three uh, three people last night, and we we're really hoping that we could help support them by hiring more custodial staff. Thank you. Okay, Aptos. Hi. Good evening. I'm Oscar. I'm Oscar. I'm Marlena. I'm Josh. And I'm Stella. <laughs> I can start. Uh, so we are currently working on the Second Harvest Food Bank uh, fundraiser. Uh, it's a pretty big event. This is our fourth year. And uh, one of uh, our main uh, biggest fundraisers is the Empty Bowls fundraiser. Uh, this year will be held November 19th. Um, and students from the ceramics classes make bowls. And the ROP cooking class will make the food. 
and it is a, a, a fundraiser for the Second Harvest Food Bank. Uh, and uh, with this, uh, we had two students, including myself, go to the Second Harvest Luncheon uh, to present to the donors uh, and the participants about what Aptos does to fundraise for this event. Um, So we have a lot of sport, uh, sporting teams who are now in the CCS, including uh, football, volleyball, and a couple of our tennis players. Um, football has a game on Friday, and volleyball plays tomorrow up, up in Marin. And so we've had a lot of, lot of good luck and a lot, lot of great seasons with these teams. Um, we have winter ball coming up. It is on... It's on what day? February 1st. February 1st, sorry. Um, and we also, I don't know. Oh, wait, sorry. Um, sorry. We also have Senior Sunrise this Saturday. Um, and this is something that everyone's been looking forward to because we had to postpone it due to um, making our quad different and we like had construction for that so all of the seniors are really excited for that and we have I think ASB were doing like a potluck kind of thing for it and um, yeah. Um, recently we just had our Singing in the Ra Rain um, play and musical and it went really well and it was definitely one of the most successful plays Aptos High has had so far and everybody had a really good time and yeah it was just really great. So this Friday we will be holding our uh, second club carnival of the semester. Uh, clubs come out. Uh, there are, I believe, over 20 clubs this year. Um, and uh, this is a fundraising event, uh, one of the four we can have during the year to sell food. Um, and it's just a nice community event. There is a lot of clubs for students to join, and it is a big recruitment event for the students and the clubs and a big fundraiser. So being ASB president, I was trying to think of a way to better give back to our teachers because they're awesome and they, you know, without them, we aren't going to be learning. So for our final, for the past couple of years, we've been doing a staff luncheon as our final. So at the end of the semester, we stay after school and we put on a big lunch and we have a little kahoot with says a couple of things about a teacher and the teachers get to play and they all have a really great time and they get to see that we're giving back to them and that we care about them. So that's a really great event that we're going to be doing at the end of the semester that the staff at all of, high, all of Aptos High School, so the custodians, the teachers, um, all the administration, everybody, they all get to see how much we care for them and how much we're thankful for them there. Uh, just really quick about PBIS, we have uh, expanded on the posters around the school and just creating this really community at Aptos uh, and being part of PBIS, uh, we have tried to get more students involved and just make them feel like they're a part of the community. Tell, um, tell, tell us what, tell us. Uh, so it's just uh, creating a more positive community at the high schools. I'm, I think it's, it might be at all the schools. I'm not sure about that. At all the yeah, schools. All the schools. Um, and just creating a, com uh, a community, a sense of community for all the students uh, no matter where they come from, uh, what their sexual orientation might be, their gender, um, just really taking that barrier down and creating a community for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. That's Wait, all. No, oh, one more. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, it's. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, so the last thing we wanted to touch on is um, Aptos has. A little bit of a littering problem and so um, thankfully though there are a bunch of students and a bunch of people that are trying to proactively fix this problem um, the um, a few of the clubs that are involved with it is um, the sustainability and surf rider clubs um, and those clubs are just trying to help uh, clean up our campus and so we have a beautification pro uh, project that is going on on Saturdays and after school where we're just like cleaning up our campus to make it look nice. So yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.
Okay, are you Pajaro Valley High School? Good evening, board members, fellow students, parents, and peers. My name is Adam Tingonen, the AESB president, and I am a representative, or student representative for Pajaro Valley High School. For activities, another milestone was accomplished by our outstanding leadership classes in the aspect of the food drive, which ended recently. Each student in the class was given the responsibility to raise at least $10 by solicitating for donations from people. Our persistence into helping those in need pulled through as we raised over $979, which translated to more than roughly 3,900 meals. This success was not primarily achieved from or for our own satisfaction, but rather with the insight of having the opportunity to contribute to our community in the best way possible. For the second week now, the Link Crew members of our school have been chaperones for freshman students that went to the Monterey Bay Aquarium. It was an educational opportunity that benefited most of the students as shown on our Instagram accounts. If you are interested to follow the account, uh, follow our account at Para Valley ASB. Give us double taps, please, to support us. Nonetheless, the ASB class is worried that Ms. Brusa may actually have uh, back problems for not only carrying the Link Crew team, but as well as her baby. Mm -hmm. The Dream Club of our school participated in the walkout event that took place on November 8th at Santa Cruz. Ramiro Medrano, the freshman counselor, was one of the main heads for this major event. Lady Lee, a student at our school, she is the president of the Dream Club, invited me to one of the meetings they were having. And when I went to this meeting, it was amazing because I was able to slightly interact and witness the California State organizer for United We Dream, Gabriela Cruz. She came to speak with the club members and educate us more insightfully to DACA and the situation our country is for the immigrants. The leadership of all the youth involved truly expressed the powerful dream the immigrants of this country yearn for as we currently face nightmares for this country. To honor the LGBTQ community at our school, the GSA Club organized an event inviting those who are part of this amazing group and those who participated, these people, for the National Coming Out Day this year, which showed the type of bonds we share with one another. Those who participated were, awarded, were rewarded with points through the Five Star app. Athletics. As the month of October came to an end, the fall sports came to an end as well. And sadly, it was an actual fall for the records of the boys' football, boys football teams and girls' volleyball teams. However, they played hard enough and tried to go as tough as they can until the end, especially the seniors who played their sport for the last time in their high school career. When one door closes, another opens. This means that the end of fall sports is only the beginning of winter sports, including boys' and girls' basketball, soccer, and wrestling. This is yet another opportunity for our student athletes to show how much Grizzly pride we have. However, their wins don't become, uh, ho hopefully we hope that their wins don't become as low as the weathers of weather temperatures of winter. Then academics. For some PV students, sadly, including myself, we did not manage our time properly and we took the ACT on October 26th and the SAT on November 2nd. It was only one week of a split, one week. Wow. Some had a motivational mindset saying, hey, at least it's not a break of two weeks since we are not two week. That was one, not one week pun, yet two week puns. <laughs> All right, with more seriousness, I truly hope our seniors are pushing hard before any of the deadlines for colleges they are applying to. Furthermore, several of the seniors have been spending most of their time at, uh, after school at our college center to obtain proper guidance for submitting college applications despite how stressful it is. With the help of reliable teachers and mentors, some have already successfully submitted their CSU applications. Crossing our fingers, we hope to get accepted into the universities we desire to attend. Thank you all for listening. My self-esteem is higher now because of the respect and support you give me. I hope you all have a good night and thank you. Thank you. <laughs> One last school, new school. Good evening, everybody. My name is Kimberly Lopez, and I am senior class president at New School. Um, my name is Millie Maciel, and I'm the secretary. Hello, my name is Joshua Lopez, and I'm a junior at New School Community High School. Um, for, our, for, uh, for our second day of outdoor science and character develop, development, we 
went to Wetlands Watch and we restored a, a parcel of agriculture land by removing non-native plants on Beach Street, San Lorenzo Valley. It was extremely hot, but we made it through the day and worked together as a team. And for the Food Well Harvest Festival, uh, we headed to UCSC and we had two stations where, where we made um, corn husk dolls and esqueviche. And for Halloween, we had uh, several activities which were door decorating, pumpkin carving, and bobbing for apples, as you could see. <laughs> Oh, oh, we also have some packets for you guys for our outdoor signs <laughs> of last year from spring. <laughs> oh, uh, we headed to the Wine and Roses event held by Pajaro Valley Community Health Trust, and we had eight new school students and two staff members of new school who volunteered and helped clean up after the event. Um, on Fridays, we go to Digital Nest, and um, at the fifth year anniversary, our work was displayed. At, at the uh, we also go to um, um, environmental workshop, and we work on many science projects. This week, we'll be, we'll, we will be building um, science um, rockets. Sorry. On October 29th and 30th, um, we had student-led conferences um, where the students talked about credit recovery, improving behavior, setting goals, um, and what they learned, and their, they talked about their attendance. They, should, they had conferences with their parents and they talked about the Aztec avenues and their achievements. We are doing, we are doing this two more times. Hello, good evening. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about the Rhodey Students of the Month. Uh, two students, uh, sorry about that. Two students selected every month uh, by the staff. Uh, the students are selected based on their efforts with the Aztec achievements. Um, each each receives a certificate, and it, it's it's invited to have uh, lunch. Um, people uh, this month, uh, two students were elected. It was a uh, Jackie and uh, Raul Ortiz. And um, hold on. and um, we'll be talking about the outdoor science and character development. Uh, we made uh, tie dye shirts with uh, the community between all the students and the teachers and just had fun between all of us. And um, we, w we went out to the slough, uh, labeled uh, the storm drains, and um, cleaned the whole slough around. And we were surprised by how many trash was around, and it just made us realize to uh, keep the environment more uh, clean. And, um, and uh, we also um, had fixed our garden, painted it, fixed it working together and motivating each other. And uh, we also had a, we had a van for our school and uh, we had a signage which was donated by uh, art and sports. And uh, it, was, it was like a school model that we had for us and it was important. And um, yeah, there you go. Not, not much, but pretty motivation, you know. <laughs> and um, uh, we had a, we had a visitor that came to our school, and it was uh, Cabrillo EOPs. She uh, visited our school during college and career uh, work. She had us apply for, for if we decide to attend, we have all the EOP support structures. That's all. And thank you for having us here. Have a good evening. Okay, we're going to do the more boring part of the agenda now, but um, we're going to actually move one of the subjects up a little earlier before even before visiting on agenda items, and Maria can tell you why we're going to do it, but it's up to her. Um, I was going to actually make a motion. I think you need to call for a motion, board president, right, as kind of our call. 
Yeah, no, she's order gonna... of protocol that you need to call for a motion. Yeah, we because will. Because there was, I had a motion for that as well. So, oh, you you, your role is to just call for a motion, not to dictate what's going to happen. Well, she has told me that she's interested in doing it. Uh, that's what I said. So, um, can I have a motion for approval of the agenda? I'd like to move to approve the agenda with moving item all action all items from nine action items, ten consent agenda. 11 deferred consent agenda and 13 action report on closed session to be after approval of the minutes action item uh, item number five and if you need an elaboration for me about an explanation as to why i could do that okay okay because I, I these, these items take less than 30 minutes and these are all action items that deal with the board the district's business and we also have one trustee that is going to be leaving early and not be able to vote on these action items it is lauded for less than 30 minutes of our agenda and the given the pack i think that we should move these items to before so she can hear those be present to vote on them as well as so it can clear for all of us seven sitting here our b district business that we have to attend and clear that from our minds so we can hear the report and discussion and the community input items do I have a second on that one I'll second her <laughs> what were can I have a point of order yeah were we were we going to move a part of the agenda forward separate from what georgia just moved mm -hmm. was there a request for that yeah I and think which maria, item was it i think maria wanted to. yeah so i wanted to move um give me one second here let me find um just item 8.3 uh before uh public comment so that was the initial motion that i was going to be making uh, given that I won't be uh, staying long enough to actually vote on the rest of the items. And I also want to be respectful of everyone that's here present. And I was hoping to at least listen to some of you before I left. Well, given that the items that I requested to move forward are an allotment of approximately 30 minutes of time, and then the item you're asking for 8.3 is approximately 25, I mean, I think there would still be plenty of coverage to do that. And we have a fairly good timekeeper with our um, vice president and chair. Okay. So I'm willing to amend that motion to also include your 8.3, Maria. And I think it's just better because it clears the district's business off of the table so we can all focus on not only the report and discussion items, but the public comment. Otherwise, we're moved into a position of having to extend the meeting. We have a second from Trustee Shocker. No, I know I'm going to. Okay, we have a first and a second. Can I have a vote on this one? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Nay. 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 So how many? What? Okay. So so what's the vote? So we we have Why don't you do a roll call on that vote so we could be yeah. clarified, please? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Clerk, can you call a roll call? Eva. Call roll call. Um, Trustee Acosta, your vote? Yay. Trustee Shopper? Yay. Trustee Holm? Nay. Trustee Orozco? Nay. Trustee DeSerpa? Nay. President Osmondson? No. Trustee Dodd? Yes. So it's, so it's um, the vote dice. The four, vote dice. Okay. Uh, Another words? Three, three, four, zero. Okay. Do you need any motion? Mm -hmm. So. Um, I would like to uh, move to approve the agenda with the following modification, moving item um, 8.3 prior to public comment. A second. Okay, can I have a vote on that one? 
All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Six zero one. Okay, now I am approving the minutes. We haven't done that yet. <laughs> I'm approving the October twenty three board minute min, meeting minutes. Can I have a motion? I'll move to approve the board meeting minutes. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Karen, okay. I'll be abstaining. Okay, because you weren't there. Right. Yeah, she, cause it was, she wasn't there. Yeah. I'm also abstaining. Okay, yeah, there's two of us that weren't, two that weren't able to be there. So we're um, 502. <laughs> 502. Those things are hard to <laughs> figure out how to do. 502. Okay. Um, no, we're going to do hers now. So we're going to do now 8.3. Do we have Lisa Aguirre? So she's our superintendent of, no, no, she's our curriculum and, and, and instruction. instruction. Yeah, <laughs> superintendent of curriculum and instruction. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so good evening, President Osmondson, Board of Trustees, audience, and Superintendent Rodriguez. Uh, thank you very much. Tonight, um, this evening, I'll be presenting a little bit about the academic counseling that's taking place in Pajaro Valley Unified School District. Um, I want to start off by uh, sharing the current counseling services that are offered at our, our various sites throughout Pajaro Valley Unified School District. Um, there are a lot of different services that are offered. Tonight, they'll be focusing on the academic counselors on the secondary level. That happens without um, on this at the middle schools, the junior high, and the high schools. So in um, when was it? So in June of 2017, the Ed Trust West published Pajaro Valley's Educational Equity Audit, and one of the key findings was the role of the high school counselor needs to be an advocate for and supporter of college and career readiness for all students, and that it needs to be clearly defined in the role and the support getting all students there. So the journey for the academic counselors, last year they started attending the Hatchings Academy. There were three different sessions that they went to for the Hatchings Academy. They've attended one um, session this year, and they'll be attending two more the, um, the rest of this year. Um, so within the national model, the, the, the counselors, within the national model of the counselors, there are three different domains. There are um, college and career, social emotional development, and academics. Um, so within the counseling realm, you, all counselors are to address all three domains. In Pajaro Valley Unified School District, we do it a little differently on our school sites, where our academic counselors serve as your tier one, where they meet with every single student or their caseload on the school campus. And then if students are having additional social emotional problems, then our social emotional counselor kind of comes in as the tier two. So it is a model that's unique to our district based on the need of our students and the need that we are her hearing from our school sites. Um, so that's what we do. The model, there is a paradigm shift. So from the old school counselor, some of you may have had in the, um, as you were growing up, to the new shift. Um, within it, the, uh, c calls for a paradigm shift in the counselor role to be more essential in the school setting being proactive with systems of delivery that is based on student data that is relevant um, to all students. It makes them a relevant and key stakeholder on that campus and promotes systematic change um, so they are agents in the school for all students. So in the past, if you remember, school counselors had different functionalities, whether it was looking at building student schedules, whether it was looking at doing um, even, for example, um, report cards or doing supervision, now it's more focused on being with the students and looking at the different needs of students and supporting all students in getting to become um, college and career ready. So the big question um, with looking at it is how it, so the academic counselors, when they, or the counselors, when they look at it, how is my work on the school site making a difference for students on our campus. 
And they do this not um, in different ways, but they're really looking at in the individuality of the students because all students have different needs, which is a big task for the, um, the counselors to take on. The four components of the program, there's a foundation, the foundational work, there's delivery system, management system, and accountability. The foundation is really looking at the vision, mission, and the goals of the counseling services provided on that school campus. So here's two examples. If you go to Aptos High, you have the vision, mission, and some of the work that's being done by the, the counselors. Um, on the right-hand side, EA Hall's mission statement for their counseling service department. If you go on the websites of our different secondary schools, you'll find many different uh, missions and visions. One of the key things is that the vision and mission aligns with the school's vision and mission. At the same time, though, looks at addressing the needs of the students on that campus to be college and career ready. The delivery system is really looking at, if you're looking at it, the, um, the guidance curriculum that is used. The curriculum that's used, we use Naviance and we also use um, the ASCA, which is the American School Counseling Association resources. And um, counselors go into classrooms and they present whole group different uh, lesson plans for students. Um, individual student planning, because we talked about every student has different needs. So there are some school sites that work with families. There's also school sites where the, the guidance counselor or the counselor works with the student one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and then there's a responsive student. So on any given day, something can happen to a student, whether it's at home coming to school or something once they get to the, arrive on that school campus, that's an immediate need. And so that's also responsive in time that has to be done with students. And then the system support, that's looking at the school climate as a whole. What activities are done during lunch? What activities are promoted? How is college week going? And system-wide things that counselors put in place. So if we look, for example, if you can go on to the guidance curriculum, if you click on that link. Oh. Um, if you go to, at, like, if you look at Aptos High, their presentations that are done, <coughs> this was one that was done um, in October for all sophomores. Um, they go into classes one time per, where well, they see all students per grade, one time per month. Um, what they do is they give a presentation for students and then they publish it on their website. So if you go to the next slide, you'll look in October what they were talking about. Go to one more. Have the objectives. And then it has requirements for college admission. So this is their sophomore year, the things that they're starting to talk about and then getting the students to think about college and what are the different things that are needed. So Aptos High, not only do they deliver it to the students, the counselors within the classrooms, then they place it on the school website. So if a student was absent or if they want to go back and review because they were that day they didn't catch all the information, they can go back. And then at the end of every presentation, if you just skip to the end, there is always for more information from your school counselor and it tells you exactly who you need to go to for that, um, for that grade level. And it says make an appointment and please contact us. So they're really trying to get into the classroom, meeting with students with one one on one. We can switch back to the other presentation, please. I think we're there. Okay. So the next part's the management system. And so really with the counselors, what you're doing is you're looking at your backwards mapping from the senior year. What is it as seniors, what is the timeline that they need to do in terms of applying? for different colleges, for writing their personal um, narrative, for applying for financial aid, and they backward map all the way to the freshman year in high school. And um, so really they're looking at what do they need to do to deliver for every single class year, and then also then they put it on a calendar, and then they do a time allotment to look at where they're spending their time. The reason why they do that is because that 80% of school counselors Time is supposed to be devoted to direct and indirect student services. With the planning, with the program planning and school support activities being only 20%. This is program management, professional development, data analysis, and management. Should only be 20% of their time. So we're really doing, within the Hatchings work, we're also looking at the time that counselors spend on different activities to see where, our, so see where we're aligned and see what shifts need to be made. The accountability system, um, really it's 
the accountability is set in place because we're looking at it and what, what has been found national is that when data is taken and counselors really look at the effectiveness of the work that they're doing on the school sites, the ones that look at this, there is higher student achievement. So for example, in the um, past, um, from what I heard from counselors, is that they were just told to do certain things by administration. When that was happening, they had no idea whether this was really making an impact on students' future or not. So one of the things is the accountability looking at for a counselor is the work that I'm doing every day really making an impact on the students. If so, how can I increase this? If it's not, what do I need to do differently to make sure that it is happening? So some of the positive outcomes. And um, where I received this data is that I went out and I actually went to different um, schools and I spoke to um, the academic counselors and I've had different meetings. So I, this is where I've gathered the information. So four years ago, high school counselors met with students two times per year. Now, fast forward four years later, it's one time per month. And that's the work changing to really looking at their new role um, and then it was canned presentations that were given by teachers so that the counselors would spend, would creating the um, presentations, handing it off to the classroom teachers and the teachers would deliver it or be an administrator delivering it. Now that the, the counselors that they've been involved in this work, they actually look at the presentations and they look at how, what they need to change and so they're customized presentations using different resources that they deliver within the classrooms. They deliver themselves. They deliver themselves. So some of the barriers, okay? So at the high school level, you, um, students are broken out by um, grade level and or alphabetical by their last name. In talking to the counselors, academic counselors, what we found, number one, is classroom time. So they're saying, um, really it takes, they're saying we understand what our role is in this new role and looking at the national map model, what we're supposed to be doing. Sometimes our administration doesn't fully understand the role that we're supposed to be playing on the school campus being an integral stakeholder. And so it's getting in and fighting with classroom time to, ha to see, be able to see the students and meet with them and deliver the information to the students. Second thing that was mentioned was the engagement with the students. Some of them said, you know what, I've never been a classroom teacher. And so when I do deliver those lesson plans, number one, I'm completely nervous. Number two, I've never been trained and so sometimes student engagement, I may be, I'm a great counselor, but when I have to present the plans, I just, I fail. And I feel like I'm not, I need to learn how to do more student engagement when I'm delivering the lesson plans. And then the last thing is that the high school counselors talk about is that they really wanna be with the students and sometimes the clerical tasks that are asked of them is taking up too much of their time. For middle school, um, some of the barriers that I've heard was the, um, the administration expectations. So it's really what it is, what we're looking at doing is um, educating the middle school administration to make sure that they truly understand the role of the academic counselor and what they should be doing. At the middle school, um, there is one academic counselor, but we also have Gear Up at almost all of the schools. So Gear Up works with all of our seventh and eighth grade students. So the academic counselor partners with our Gear Up to um, not only hold parent meetings in the evening, but then also meet with students during the day. Um, many school counselors on the middle school level experience role stress and confusion due to the conflicting and incongruent messages that they receive from administrators and other stakeholders who fail to understand the actual role of the school counselor. Um, the other thing that we're looking at is the barrier is the hyper-focus on at-risk students. Um, and I'll talk a little more about that. And then um, time, time to make sure that they are seen because really with the school counselor, when the students leave, then they don't have that opportunity to meet with the students when they go home for the day. So some of the next steps, um, we'll start with the middle school when we looked at there's a hyper focus on the at risk students and the reason why is because of the, our own district policy. District policies almost the counselors feel at the middle school level it mandates them to have to have this focus on the at risk students and make sure that they're informing the parents. And so what this does is it detracts from looking at the entire population and figuring out what can be put in place for everybody and not just the at risk students. It starts actually in August, their checklist of as they go through the year of looking at at risk students. 
So looking at what we can do with the district policies to um, kind of loosen, to figure out how we can change that so that all students are addressed. Um, look at middle school alignment of practices to ensure that um, counselors, what they're being asked at all the sites are the same. For example, at some middle schools, they were asked to do um, grades, where this is keeping them away from students. Instead, they should be focusing on working with the students. And then at high schools, um, look at the instructional practices. How do we support them in feeling more confident in delivering the um, different curriculums that they deliver inside the classrooms? And then also look at um, clerical help. And with that, today is World Kindness Day. And on this day, I want to take a moment to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak on behalf of our academic counselors and sh just share a smidgen of the work that they do in their integral role in the social, emotional, and academic learning of all PVUSD students. And there you go. Question. Can you go back to slide six for me? I just yep. wanted to make make a comment on that. So I think there's two things that are really unique about PVUSD that I just want to mention. One is the board did approve to maintain um, EOP or gear up at the high school level. So we, we do contribute $1.5 million a year for to maintain the college and career centers open at the high school level. So as you know, gear up grant, how it goes is it's cyclical, right? It's cohort driven. So it starts at the middle school level. It follows that cohort all the way to 12th grade. So what, had, what would have happened if we hadn't contributed that is we would have um, taken away, we would have closed all of our college and career centers. We did for the first time in 10 years, we did open back up the college and career center at, um, at Aptos High because Aptos High did not have the support of Gira because they are not a Title I school. The second thing I just want to mention is the significant support that we have from PVPSA. So we literally are one of the only models that we have within the state of California where that has a nonprofit that specifically only supports the school site. So as we know, our counselors with a PPS credential legally can only provide a certain level of support. The benefit of PVPSA is that we are able, which I know we're not going into PVPSA, but it, it fits in that circle, right? Is that it allows our, our students who need ongoing support, right, to have that support. Um, and so I do wanna mention that because those are two things that um, are unique to us and um, and we've dedicated significant resources to um, to both of those partnerships Wow okay any speakers to this one item okay so board comments Jennifer Schachter so you mentioned that um, the counselors felt that district policy was hindering their work. Yes. So um, you said that there are some things that are going to be done about that. What is going to be done about that? Well, we're going, to, we're going to pull out all of the policies which they feel they're bound to, looking at the at-risk students every, all the time and looking at the time allotment to see how we change that where they're still addressing the needs of the at-risk students, but at the same time opens up space where they can address all students. And just to piggyback on that, what are we, what steps do we have in place to ensure that um, administration is it's respecting the rules of the, the academic counselors? That so, wasn't clear to me. Yeah, so in the Hatchings Academy, um, an administrator um, is invited to go, and some school sites, they send an administrator. Um, what I need to do is actually go back and find out more exactly which of the administration doesn't have a clear role. For example, at the last principal meeting, I did have a conversation with one of the principals who asked me why this couldn't happen anymore, and my answer was because the counselors need to be with the students, and that's detracting from the time. So it's really going back and almost cleaning up the practices that were inherent that's been for the long-standing time within the counselors, and it's really my role to go back and work with the administrators. And do we find that that's the case across middle schools? Um, some middle school administration does understand the role, but that's, that's where probably the least um, understanding is, is, uh, occurs and the most um, 
education needs to happen. Okay. Um, and then what benchmarks do we have in place to measure success of the new direction? So each of the counselors are actually taking their own data and they're um, looking at, they've chosen one thing that they're really looking at and taking data for it to see how it has made an impact. So part of the program is that they really do have to focus on something and so um, it's in the works and depending on what they chose to look at with the data and then we'll have that at the end of this year. Okay, so it'll be great to uh, bring that back as an item for discussion. Um, I just really do wanna highlight the the, um, uh, how I'm so happy that we're finally sort of attempting to align, right, the, the, the role of the academic counselor across the district. I think before it was really sporadic and people were doing different things. And then the other thing is also really um, defining the responsibilities of a social emotional versus academic. Mm -hmm. uh, I think before they have always been intertwined and I think that's probably one of the major reasons why academic counselors were not able to do the work that they were supposed to be doing. Um, so I'm really happy to see that we're shifting directions and I'm looking forward to um, a report on the impact uh, that this change is bringing. Thank you. Could I comment? <clears throat> um, would it be more beneficial if the counselors met with seniors closer to like application time, like twice a month? Because I know that it's like harder, like closer to the beginning of the year when, because being met like one time in a class with like multiple people sometimes they aren't able to get around to every single student because I go to Aptos and I've like, I'm not a senior, but I've like, for the times in class where they give us presentations, they don't get to meet with everyone because class periods are 45 minutes. So it's a great, um, so looking at the timeline of when they go in and what they present and how they can be more effective with meeting with smaller groups or, okay. Thank you. That's all. I'll do. I mean, I was just gonna, I, I mean, wanted to see, I, I, I don't know if you can go back to, not the slide that where you talked about middle school, but the other slide about the issues, the kind of problems that, um, s that they're the having. Barriers. Let's see. No, not that one. The barriers, yeah. For middle school or high school? High school. I, I know what the middle schools kind of are. So, I just, so you're saying also that they, there you go. okay, so they, they need more clerical tasks done by other people, not them. Is that one of the ones? It's what is being said now, but within the time management, like looking at the time, but that could be useful for them. Yeah, that was mentioned, and I just wanted to share their voice. Yeah, so they didn't want to spend a lot of time to clerical. Like making be passes, students. looking at the list of who needs to be called out for the specific group that's coming. So um, when, um, let's see, engagement students during, so are, I was confused because I, I guess I don't understand completely their role. Uh, they're actually providing them curriculum? Each month for the high school, they go into different classrooms um, with students and provide um, different presentations on how to apply for colleges, what do you need at this point, how do you apply for a college uh, um, college financial aid. Oh, okay, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Okay, because I was talking about curriculum, kind of curriculum. I was confused about what that curriculum was. Oh, because that, that kind of stuff. It's, yeah, and it's a lesson plan that they develop and they deliver. Okay. Um, when you were talking about with Maria that they think of stuff that they're gonna present that they feel like they're doing well. Just give me an example of what they might look at in terms of you know, what they might look at their year and see, um, just for fun, but just for just an example. Um, are you talking about like the different things that they do in the classroom? You were talking to Maria about that they will look at what they've done well and kind of oh. monitor what they've done well by the end of the year. So for so, example, yeah. um, 
what Miss Sierra said yeah. was that um, it's possible that it's not as effective when they go into the classroom and do one um, lesson, right, with the, with the entire class, and then that's yeah. it once a month. Yeah. So if we go through and if we look that as compared to last year versus this year when they're doing it, that it has not made a difference in the number of students applying for college application, then hmm, maybe that um, delivery needs to be changed and needs to be looked at. What, um, but for example, if it jumped by tenfold, then possibly that could be something. That was just an example. So, um, but when they're having the presentations with the classroom, they're also meeting with each student. They have to figure out not only pr making the presentation for the classroom, they, but figure. No, they don't meet with um, every single student. Um, they meet as a group. They sometimes meet at smaller groups, and sometimes they meet with individual students. It all depends on the individual need, if the parents reach out, if the student reach out. There's different factors that determine if they meet with individual students. Okay, so it could be the parents, or they could be just them. I just need to meet with you because I have this, and then they do meet with mm -hmm. the student if the student requests, and mm -hmm. they need to sit down with them and go over. Yes. Okay, but other than that, they do make presentations once a month. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and so it's words, one time per week that they're doing a presentation because a lot of times they support each other, and so they're going into the classrooms. All of the classrooms, obviously. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> you have four different years at the high school. So. Exactly. Okay. Um, I, I got the one about middle school and dealing with at risk and all of them. I got that part. Um, so, and then you talk about the gear up support so that they, they don't, they, they might not have, they might not be able to participate in all the ways that they would like to, but they have gear up doing some of the work too. Is that what you're saying? In the yeah, middle school? the middle school, they're partnering with the gear up counselors. And so they're really looking at and um, working together to do the work. So the they're looking at, so right, so yes, they're they're partnering with the gear up. So is that the same in the, in, in the high schools as well? When, it yes, like, uh -huh. yes, when the gear ups are on the high school, they do. There's a lot of, if we go back to that slide of all the different counseling, the academic counselor also doesn't work in isolation and they work with all the different counseling services that are in PVUSD. Oh, migrant counselor, scholarship, coordinator, family. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a lot of stuff to, yeah, that's, I saw that, I thought, okay, that's a lot of ways to do, you know, work. <laughs> all right, thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> Maria's still with us. <laughs> so, um, now we're going to uh, visitor non-agenda items. Right. So we need to do hopefully three at a time. And um, we're trying not to have to vote on staying longer. So we're... Two minutes. So we're, we're, we really want to try to see if you can really try to do the two minutes. I mean, and we're going to we're gonna be on everybody. The people making the presentations, had to, they had a only a certain amount of time, and we would have cut them off, too, <laughs> the pre people that are doing the other presentations. So the, the first three we have is Eriberto Estrada, Erica Murphy, and Amy Laura. And Laura. be close together, you three, so you can come up right after the other. One after the other. Yeah, put, pull it down, pull it down, pull it down. There you go. <laughs> okay. Oh. Hi, my name is Eriberto Estrada. I am a sixth grader at Cesar Chavez Middle School, and my mom is a union member and teacher at H.A. Hyde Elementary School. She works in the district where she grew up, and uh, she's been a teacher for almost 20 years. She loves working here because she sees herself in her students. She was an English learner, a daughter of migrant workers, and now my mom. I'm proud of her because she has a lot of responsibility, works hard, and late every day. She sometimes has to work through the weekend. Please, I'm asking for the board and district support. I want my family to be able to afford living here. Um, I want my mom and other educators to be valued and be a priority. Budgeting for a proper teacher raise is one way to show that. They are the ones instructing, inspiring, and motivating us. 
Supporting teachers directly supports us, the students. Thank you. It's a hard act to follow. So I wanted to speak up for, I'm, yes. I wanted to speak up for SPED and uh, specifically yeah, a different kind of counselor that we have in the district. Uh, the mental health clinicians who serve the special ed students with emotional disturbances and provide what is called educationally related mental health services or ERMS. Uh, I've worked as a social emotional counselor and as a guidance counselor for years in the district and in these roles I've relied heavily on the ERMS counselors and the others in the special ed department. Um, the school psychologists and the case managers and the RSP teachers, SDC teachers. When I saw students in my office presenting with serious mental health issues, I needed their help. I needed these special programs to refer the students to. The ERMS counselors provided consultation and advice, and they helped me identify signs of serious mental illness and to distinguish these serious conditions from more common discipline problems or academic issues, and they helped me respond appropriately. Um, I needed the ear of the school psychologist to elevate these very serious cases to so that they could be assessed and given the special services they needed. And I needed the case managers to provide accommodations and advocate for these students. As a social emotional counselor at PV High, my caseload was the entire school. I could not serve the highest need students alone. I relied on the expertise and the programs of the special education department. Many students who came to my office were really suffering and unable to access their education due to anxiety, PTSD, depression, bipolar disorder, and schizophrenia. Because of special education experts, those students got the services they needed. Before I had the training and expert experience, I did not recognize when a student was having symptoms of a psychotic break or what to do about it. But the ERMS therapists did, and they were able to respond appropriately and protect the students and others from harm. These cases of severe mental illnesses often end up in the lap of the student services directors, and these were the cases that the ERMS therapists were able to handle. The ERMS therapists add value not just to the SPED department, but to the district as a whole. The district is very fortunate to have an in-house team of mental health experts at their disposal. The ERMS therapists are partnering with sites and departments across the district to provide mental health education to students, staff, and parents. ERMS counselors have joined forces with the social emotional counselors to respond to crises such as the death of a student. They are providing direct treatment to, student, to students in need. They are pro providing parenting classes in conjunction with the SARB process, uh, pa um, participating in autism research, and providing teachers and admin with expert consultation services. Two minutes, thank you. Good evening, my name is Amy Lauta. I'm here with some of my esteemed colleagues from Duncan Holbert. We wanna take the time to thank Ms. Orozco for visiting our school yesterday, for seeing the wonderful work that we do and hearing some of our concerns. Duncan Holbert is an amazing community of educators, students, and families that partner together to support our special education students in early intervention. As I'm sure you know, there's much evidence to support early intervention and its positive outcomes. Early intervention, when implemented correctly, greatly impacts student development and access to general curriculum. Research shows that it also benefits districts financially, as many students, after receiving intensive early intervention services, need less tier three support, less intervention, and some students exit special education altogether. We would like to take this time to inform you that currently, almost 50% of our preschool students are not receiving speech and occupational therapy services that are specified in their IEPs. This is due to a lack of specialists assigned to the school and an unprecedented number of students that are qualifying for special education. By not fulfilling the legal obligation to provide said services to our students, we are concerned that this will not only impact these students, but the district as a whole. We are out of compliance and legal action could result. With projections of up to at least 32 students per teacher by spring of 2020, safety is of utmost concern. This is our top priority. We have a commitment to the families that we serve when their children come to school at Pajaro Valley Unified. We will afford them a safe and education I'm sorry, that we will afford them a safe and engaging learning environment. Thank you very much for your time and consideration. Thank you. Up next, we have Graciela Lorenco, Julie Valens, and Laura Azaro. So Graciela, are you still here? Gracelia? Oh, okay. Julie Valens? Hello. 
My name is Julie Valens and I teach third grade at a MSD school. I want to share my concern about how our students have not been receiving speech services this entire school year. I have two students who qualify for speech services. One of them comes from a family that speaks Mixteco and Spanish. He has been in speech since he started school. In first grade, he was silent most of the year. In second grade, he started to say a few things, but was very difficult to understand. He sat by himself on the playground because it was too hard for his classmates to understand him. By the end of second grade, he would say a few words, but still was very shy. This year in third grade, he has been starting to open up more. One day around Halloween, another student at his table group was on her Chromebook, and it, we, it, the Chromebook made a weird noise. I was trying to help her figure out what it was. This little guy came over to her side of the table, put his head near the computer like he was going to listen for it, and mumbled, it's Chucky. <laughs> we started laughing, surprised by his joke. This might, sound like, this might not sound like a big deal. It's a tiny little story. But for me, it was amazing for several reasons. First of all, he made a joke out loud without any prompting. Secondly, he demonstrated that he had the cultural capital to know who Chucky is. I had no idea he knew that. Yeah. Third, he was interacting playfully with a classmate when in the past he has struggled to make friends. My next thought was, imagine how much more he could be improving if he was getting the services that he's qualified for. Next week is conference week. I'll be telling his parents that he's making progress, that he hasn't had any speech services yet this year because we don't have a speech teacher. Through our Mixteco translator, they'll probably say, okay, maestra está bien, ¿cuándo piensa que va a empezar? When do you think, that's fine, when do you think he'll start? What should I tell them? Thank you. Thank you. Again, Laura Azaro, Laura, are you still here? Laura Azaro, Melissa Dennis, and Erica Torres. Good evening, Dr. Rodriguez and the board. And I, I just want to thank you for all your hard work that you're doing. I haven't shadowed any of you, but I imagine you're working very hard. I've been um, an elementary school teacher here in PVUSD for 26 years. And um, I've really enjoyed the family connections uh, I really value and treasure that I work in a cooperative environment instead of a competitive environment. Um, I do really appreciate the benefits. <laughs> and, um, and I do appreciate, Dr. Rodriguez, that you are making yourself available. You're a strong leader. Um, I know we don't always agree on everything, m you know, metaphorically speaking, but I really do appreciate that you are making yourself visible and you've really, you're doing a lot. Um, the thing that I'm here to talk about, though, is that as I've been teaching over the years, there's just a lot more hats that I'm having to wear. And part of it is because we are in a profession that is more people-centered. And it takes money to pay the people. And there's been a lot of... Um, redu reduction of services provided by people. And where I'm seeing it the most at the elementary level is there's a lot more um, emotional instability in our students because of mental illness or um, family issues or community stressors. And um, they're just not getting the services that they need. We used to have paraprofessionals that were in our classrooms, and they slowly got diminished. And you know what the test scores don't show is what those other people were doing during the day to help support those students on those days that they were melting down because they had to take a math test. And the rigor is just, it's very intense for elementary school kids. And we all take it very sincerely and work very hard to help them pass their tests. but when you're having to help a child who's under the desk in fourth grade screaming and crying because they are perceiving that they can't do the, the, the task and I'm the only one there that can sue that child, where does that leave the rest of the students? Where are those academics gonna be? So those don't show up on those bar graphs that we look at every year for the test scores. What's going on between those bars and behind those bars? 
we do, we do need more people, and, and it would be very nice to have a raise just to uh, appreciate what we've been trying to do. Thank you. My, these are broad, but they're not that broad. Hi, I'm a teacher at Ohlone Elementary School. I'm also a proud member of PVFT. Um, I'd like to talk about our contract, but unfortunately I'm here again for the fourth time in a row to talk to you about chromium-6 in the drinking water at Ohlone. For those of you who don't know, chromium-6 is linked to increased levels of cancer, and uh, our level of chromium-6 is 500 times higher than California's level for public health. In fact, there is so much carcinogenic chromium-6 in our water that the State Water Board has offered our school free water service. Um, and that offer has been uh, made to us for many months, and we still have not taken advantage of it. <clears throat> um, we have still not received one long-term or short-term plan or solution from the district. Um, we'd like to accept the water services ourselves, but it needs to be administered through the district, so we feel stuck. Why don't we take advantage of this solution? Do you have a different plan? And if so, what is it? Um, last night at the parent school, school site council, some parents offered to bring gallon jugs of water into their students' classroom, but I just don't see that being a good solution. What we need at Ohlone is leadership. We need solutions. I had one suggestion. Include us in your planning and in your solutions. Um, include one parent and one teacher because we're the ones drinking the water. And so far, we have no idea what the plan is to get clean water. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Erica. I am here um, because I have a freshman daughter in high school, and I am worried uh, about the safe, about the supervision of PV students in the morning. Uh, I found out this morning that my daughter and other PV students uh, get dropped off by the school bus while there is no supervision, and will walk off campus to nearby places. I am concerned not only for the safety of my daughter but also the safety of any student that leaves campus. I talked to the assistant principal today and he informed me that there is no supervision from the time the students get dropped off until staff gets there at about 7.15 or so. Although it might not be a long period of time, it's still concerning to me and it's something that I was not aware of that was happening. The answer that I got from him was, you may not like the answer, but it is reality. That's what's going on and there's no one there in the morning which was very disappointing. Uh, I hope something can be done about this um, so that the kids are safe and they're not leaving campus and something happens to them while the parents think they're at school. Thank you. So next up we have Emily Rodriguez, Brandon Denise, Denise, and Eli Reynolds. Good evening, my name is Emily Elizabeth Rodriguez. I am a student at McQuitty Elementary School. Some of my favorite things about McQuitty are teachers. Teachers are very kind and helpful. What would you do, what would, what would, a, be, uh, what would a, a school be without teachers, counselors, and nurses? A challenge for my family is the cost of living since we live in Salinas and community every day. I am asking for your support. Thank you. Um, good evening. I'd like to thank the board again for affording me the opportunity to speak to you tonight. Um, a lot has happened since I last spoke here. Uh, matter of fact, I got married to the woman that I love. Um, so that's pretty awesome. Um, so I feel like I'm on the cusp of this area of time in my life where I have some personal and professional questions that need answering um, sooner or later. Um, so professionally, I serve on the California Federation of Teachers Special Committee on Special Education. 
Um, so I recognize that the, a lot of these issues that we face are not just district level, not just state level, but they're also nation level issues. And so that begs the question that I ask myself, am I at a district that's at the forefront of providing students and meeting the diverse needs of our student population? Or am I at a district that pr um, prioritizes pocketbooks and political agendas? After five years in the district, I'm not quite sure I have an answer to that question. <sighs> Personally, I wonder if I can support a family in this district, or should I uh, make the most financially prudent decision and take a job over the hill? Um, I don't want to leave, so that's why I continue to do what I do, and I advocate and I fight until I can confidently answer these questions. Does this district put their students first, and does the district support and empower their teachers and enable us to set down roots and grow together? And that's what I want to do in this district, is grow together, and I'm asking for your support and recognition of all that we do. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm a teacher at Bradley Elementary, life skills. Um, when I woke up this morning and got to school at 7 a.m., please believe the first thing I didn't think was I would love to be speaking to you guys at this time and miss putting my 13-month-old daughter to bed and eating dinner with my wife. But I come here because I want to be here, because I want you guys to hear what we do every day. Um, and we work hard every day. We don't ever stop. It doesn't matter what's happening out there. We put our students first, and um, it's, it's, dis it's, it's discouraging when I go to a rep meeting and you are offering a 1% raise with the contingency of getting the students to come to school. Like, it's our job to go jump in the buses and pick up students and get the 97% uh, AB, whatever it's called, you want... How is that us teachers? Why, why would our raise be contingent on that? It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And I'm, we're not in it for the pay. You know, we know that. But we are in it to live. And when me and my wife, who's a speech therapist for this district, have to think about going to live somewhere else or going back to live with our parents because we can't afford to raise our child here it doesn't make any sense to me. We love being here, we wanna be professionals, we wanna be adults, but I feel like I'm getting out of college right now and I don't have a job that can pay for what I need. Um, I will give you guys props that I, there is a tentative agreement to uh, give FMLA time, family bonding time to both of your employees. Because when we had our first daughter, I had to split my family bonding time with my wife because we both work for you. And doesn't make a lot of sense either there because, yeah, we both want to be with our daughter. So I do want to give you props for doing that. But if we end up having a second kid before we figure all this out, what's going to happen? Do I get my time with my family or do I not? So, <sighs> but thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next three are Stacy Dietrich, Laura Zucker, and Chris Webb. Um, hello, my name is Stacy Dietrich. I'm a speech language pathologist, and I've been working at Ohlone Elementary for about 10 years. Laura Zucker and I um, spoke previously at the board meeting on October 9th about our concerns with uh, the augmentative and alternative communication system within our district. From the feedback we received after we spoke, um, perhaps we didn't make ourselves clear that we were talking about concerns with the policies in place with this, the department and not the people that are doing the jobs themselves. We had previously spoken to administration about our concerns and nothing had happened, so we decided to talk to the board. Last week, Laura and I were able to meet with Regina Bauer and Angeli Butler and expressed our concerns about these issues. The policies that we are concerned about are as follows. Number one, the AAC team is working off the candidacy model and not the participation model. The particip participation model is the, what the American Speech and Hearing Association states is the best practices at this time. 
and the candidacy model should no longer be used. Number two, the site SLP and the classroom teachers have more interaction and more current knowledge of the students that are being assessed for augmentative communication and that they are given little or no input. More collaboration between all of the team members are, is important to get what is best for these students. Number three, site SLPs and classroom teachers should have input on what words are on the device so they are able to access the classroom academic vocabulary and participate where it is appropriate in the classroom. Most importantly, the AAC specialists are part of the IEP team and not a standalone service. The whole team needs to be able to collaborate and figure out how is best to meet each individual student's needs. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Laura Zucker, speech pathologist at Hyde School. At any rate, when we spoke, to continue, when we spoke with Regina Boyer and Angie Butler last week, Regina's our boss and Angie Butler's our program specialist, we discussed possibilities on how to make this, progress, this process work better. One idea was to have a more flexible process in place in regard to the augmentative and alternative communication assessment process and services. For instance, some IEP teams may feel more comfortable with augmentative and alternative communications and with the speech generating devices themselves. Some speech pathologists in our district may want to be more involved in the assessment and feel comfortable with the report writing and acquisition of the speech generating devices. Some teams may also want to be in charge of adding words on the devices, but may just need help from the specialist with updating devices. Now other teams may have a more hands-off approach. There are SLPs in our s district that have stated that they like having a specialist who can help them navigate through the process. The AAC specialists have a unique set of skills and those skills can be used in a variety of ways. If, they're not, if they are not having to do the job of programming words on the devices for some students, in other words, if those of us who are able to program words on the devices, which is not hard to learn how to do, um, could add words, had permission to add words to the devices, the AAC specialist would not feel overwhelmed and they would have more time to devote to the, devote to the SLPs and the teams that need more help. This would put benefit everyone by putting the resources where they're most needed. What we need is for there to be flexibility within the process. One size does not fit all in this situation. To better serve our students, the IEP team should have input in what is best in, in their situations. IEPs should be individualized. And so how we serve our students with, and so should be how we serve our students with complex communication needs. The last thing I would say is, yes, true collaboration is what we need. We always talk about re uh, attention and, I mean, attracting and retaining teachers, and we know we, are, we have a problem with turnover in our special ed department, um, our SDC teachers and our specialists. So this would be a great example where we could actually go ahead and collaborate truly on this item. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Chris Webb with Renaissance High School. Um, I have many teacher friends across districts and grade levels. Very few of them work in alternative ed. Um, I, it's just not for everybody. And one thing I'm noticing at Renaissance is that sometimes we have trouble uh, retaining the strongest teachers or hiring the strongest teachers, which means we might start a school year with a vacancy and then it becomes even more challenging because we have a sub and the, the standards are, are not quite the same as they would be normally. And then when a new teacher is finally hired, uh, it's even harder for them. The normal testing that any teacher gets at that school is harder because suddenly <laughs> the kids are rebelling against the raising of standards beyond what a normal sub would do. Considering uh, I, you know, Dr. Rodriguez, you came by today, had a good presentation. I really appreciate the point about electives and like boosting attendance that way. And I think if we are to attract teachers to uh, pull them away from the private sector, we're going to have to give some serious thought about uh, you know, the wages that is going to really do that and the, the wages that are going to keep people around. This is my fifth year at, the, at Renaissance. And I'm just talking about the teaching part. At Renaissance, we have other hats that we're wearing. We're advisors. We're counselors. Sometimes we're like borderline parents. Um, 
There's times when uh, the teachers will give of themselves all the time they do it. It's, si it's beyond contract, it's going to these extra meetings, it's sometimes driving kids around. Um, I, I jumped a kid's car like, you know, uh, before. There's all these different things that happen. And I think the teachers were willing to do it, but it's, it would be wrong to take advantage of the generosity. Or, and, and the other thing is, if we're really serious about the high expectations, um, you know, I mean, there's a reason CEO pay is so high. If, if the logic is with CEOs, you, the more you pay, the better quality you get, you would think that that would translate here. So I just hope that you'll keep these considerations and challenges in mind uh, during the negotiations. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Next three, we have Whitney Damiani, Manuel Serrano, and Mary Jo Silva. Thank you. Hi, thank you. My name is Whitney Damiani. I'm a math teacher at Aptos High. I have a bunch of my students here. I'm really proud to see you guys here. Um, I'm also the, one of the department chairs um, and sit on the data committee. This is my third year at Aptos as a teacher and my fifth year teaching. Um, as far as department chair duties go, part of my job is to hire teachers. It's been very challenging to hire qualified credential math teachers. Um, we went through many rounds of, of interviews this year and we have some, two great new teachers, but they don't have credentials. So we really want to have a, a pay, a living wage that supports teachers coming into our district and staying. Um, beyond that, I would like to say personally that I'm an Aptos High alumni. I love this community. I love this school. These kids know that. I love to go to everything I can. Um, but I'm sleeping on a couch. I'm at my parents' house on a couch. I cannot afford to live here. And um, as much loyalty as I have to my school, uh, to my, you know, my home for four years as a student, and my home for three years as a teacher, I cannot stay here because I cannot live here. And I cannot continue as a 33-year-old woman living on my parents' couch, having a professional job, having a degree and post-credentials, and having to be forced to live at home. It's not reasonable. So I ask that you consider that. Um, and consider that we have this reputation for turnover, and that's, it's embarrassing for me. I want my students to know that we have teachers that are here for them, that are going to be there here for them, and that are going to continue to work to collaborate and um, continue to improve our school and all of the expectations that we have for them. I want to be able to hold for ourselves, and we can do that better if we pay our teachers better. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my, my name is Manuel Serrano. I'm the, one of the teachers for the Briley School, and I'm here because um, I'm part of the Briley group. Um, but also, I'm an early childhood educator. And thank you. <laughs> and, but I, I want to tell you that a big crisis is happening right now in my department and um, in the whole county, I think. Um, we have many programs Head Start, my, uh, Migrant Head Start, and the state preschools. And, there's no more teachers. There's no more early childhood educators, educators, teachers. And one of the big situations is the salary. And, but I want to tell you that we're very important for the district. And um, I think we're the first people who detect um, uh, early intervention for the students. And also, we are the ones who we help the students. For example, uh, last year, I have 48 students at Bradley. And I want to tell you two stories about the outliers and the data. Uh, one student for Sweden in my classroom and two homeless students in my classroom. And thanks to my advocacy and for the district, they, they have, you have the services. Um, five of my students has the services uh, for, uh, for ear impairment, speech, speech and behavior and stuff. And thank you so much for the Duncan Holver people, really professional EIPs. I show, them, I, I show up to the EIPs and really wonderful results. And this year we're moving, and I hope next year I will talk to you about good stuff from there. But, uh, but also I want to tell you that it's really hard to find now early childhood educated teachers because we're really the poorest teachers in the district. And um, Head Start teachers are moving to the district because you, thank you, you give us some, um, for the last uh, negotiation, you give us an increment of 13% in our salaries. But uh, many of the Head Start teachers start moving to the district. But now Head Start is no uh, covering the, the necessity for the county because there's no teachers. And here we have problems to have substitutes in our early childhood education because there's no teachers. But there's no problem to hire um, administrators or, or um, coordinators. 
There is a lot of coordinators, and it's good. They help us a lot. But I want to tell you, there's some kind of dispar uh, disparity. Or, well, but there is something. There's there's no matching because um, I see that in the classroom. And hey, I'm 55. I'm ready to retire. But maybe I don't know who's coming yeah. behind me. Maybe nobody. But uh, I feel I'm doing a good job over there at Bradley. Bradley's an incredible place to, to, to work, like any other place. I have been working in other places, thank you. Um, but I hear, the, I hear the problems about 50% of the preschoolers that don't have the services for speech, and, I, and it's really sad. And uh, the water problem in, Ho, in um, Ohlone, wow, I see that there's a lot of stuff that I didn't think about it. But um, please support thank your you. teachers. Thank you so much. Good evening, members of the board, Dr. Rodriguez. My name is Mary Jo Silva. I'm with Manuel with Early Childhood Education, and I'm here to advocate for the entire ECE department. Um, I hear time and time again how these teachers just love what they do. They're early child educators. They continue their um, 105 hours of continued education. Uh, parents love the teachers. The students love the teachers. The teachers are so pleased and, and happy with what they do, but the biggest challenge is the salary and the cost of living. Thank you for thir the 13% increase, and it's still not enough. We're still one of the lowest ranked early childhood education salary bases in comparison to others like North Monterey County, over the hill at Gilroy, perhaps even San Jose. I don't know. I have to do a little bit more homework, but I'm here to ask for your support. Uh, I hear, it's, yes, we're probably, yeah, we're probably lower than, than the rest of the other regions, but again, my message is clear. Please give us a little bit more money. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we have two more people left. It's Maya Lord and Sonia Quintero. Maya? Okay, Maya Lord. She left. Okay. Sonia. Sonia Quintero. Hello, my name is Sonia Quintero. I want to thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk. And I'm, I'm a teacher from Calabasas Elementary School. I'm a first grade teacher. I've been a teacher there for well in the district for 20 years. I've also been. Um, a support teacher, a teacher's aide for six years, parent, teach, parent volunteer for six years. And uh, during the process, well, if you hear my voice, it's a little scratchy because I teach with one vocal cord all day long. Um, but I love working with my students, and that's why I work what I'm doing right now. And the kids ask me, you know, why are, do you talk like that? I said, well, I love working here, but I, I needed to, you know, deal with what I had to do to work. And the other day I was talking to my students and I asked them, well, it's part of our career, you know, um, consciousness about what do you want to do when you grow up? And usually we have more students that reply that they want to be teachers, but we only had two students that replied they want to be a teacher. And I was wondering why. You know, a lot of kids don't want to be, think about being teachers anymore because they see all the hard work we do and we don't get very much pay. And I tell them, I love working with you because you guys are the tomorrow. You guys are our future. You guys are going to be figuring out how to figure out the problems in the world. So you guys have a lot to give. But what I like about here, about my, my favorite things here about the, the district are my students. As you notice, I really love to work with them. The health care benefits, I think we a lot of us, we work here because of the health benefits. Um, and the families, just working with the families here, it's very rewarding. But um, the challenges here working in, in the Powder Valley are the services for the kids. We're seeing that they're lacking a lot of resources. We have our speech therapist that, that is overloaded. And uh, the cost of uh, living is giving us a hard time to stay here and keep the quality teachers. And that's what we need. We need to invest in putting the money to supporting the students and to keeping quality teachers. And that big part of it is a living wage. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay.
Thank you, Ms. Sonia Quintero, for all your years to the district. And it's one reason why that I'm here, because of all those years as a student and many white. Thank you. Hey. Now we're going to have the unions come up, Pato Valley Federation of Teachers. Gracias. Um, hello, I'm Nelly. Good evening, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, I'm actually going to give my time to one of our negotiation members, um, Greg Tucker. And um, I hope you've been enjoying our family that we brought along. Hi, Dr. Rodriguez. Hello, board members. Um, I, I first want to I want to thank the board for kind of noticing the fact that the room was full of people who were here for the public comment session and not bumping us, who the majority of us who have to go to work tomorrow, you know, educating students, not bumping us back an entire hour plus perhaps if people ran over. Um, the 25 minutes or so, you know, was, was more than enough. Um, We've been in the negotiations process since last February or so, and um, we've we've TA'd a, bu a bunch of things, but all the financials were pushed at the end of last year over to this year. And the board has a has a responsibility to kind of question everything, and allocate all funds and approve all financial expenses, and and. I think that the board also really needs to pay attention to the fact that teachers are, are fleeing this district. And yeah, we have some really good benefits, and that is important, but we have really low salaries, at least the teachers do, compared to like-sized districts. Um, The, the business of a school district is educating students and the people directly responsible for the education of students are teachers. And if we as a district and you as a board cannot invest right there, then, then the district and the board are failing. It's that simple. Um, we have a negotiation session tomorrow. You guys had a closed session today. For some reason, I guess because I'm a teacher, I'm still hopeful <laughs> that even though every time we get very little, I'm still hopeful that maybe tomorrow's the day. Maybe tomorrow's the day. Or maybe I wrote sub plans for no reason again and hope that whoever happens to work for our, our ridiculously low sub rate and shows up in my classroom tomorrow doesn't blow things up. Um, you know, we have a really, I feel, reasonable request on the table of a $2,500 across the pay scale raise for teachers. We know that the budget is tight. We didn't ask for the 15% or so that we actually legitimately should be asking for. We asked for 2,500 bucks. And, and for myself, who's like 23 years in as a teacher, um, that percentage wise is really small because we also know that we really need to kind of pay the people who are sleeping on their parents' couches and living like, you know, in ridiculous kind of situations, rolling into our school's parking lots in their home, you know. Um, so, you know, perhaps tomorrow we're going to see something other than a 1% raise in exchange for doing something that isn't really our job. Um, that's my hope. 
because I am still hopeful. But, you know, as you've heard from a lot of my colleagues today, that, that hope is sort of starting to wither. And if teachers don't have hope, they can't transmit hope to their students, and the students can't have hope, and again, the district fails. So please, you know, do what you can, find money where you can, and put it where it really needs to go. Thank you, you guys. Okay, California School Employees Union. Anybody here? Um, how about the managers? Oh, there you go. There's California School Employees. Yay. Hi. Hi. How are you guys doing? Well, good evening, President Osborne. Okay. And Mrs. Rodriguez, Dr. Rodriguez, and the trustees and the cabinet. So my name is Richard Martinez. I'm a district electrician. And I would like to thank all you guys for listening from everyone else here, everyone behind me. We support our teachers. We support our members. I'm also thankful for some of you guys that listen to us. Ms. Osman, I talked to you this weekend. Mm -hmm. It was great to talk to you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Also, I'm truly appreciative what you guys try to do for us, but sometimes it ain't enough. I do have one question. This is for Dr. Rodriguez. Our new school, Watsonville Prep. They're teaching K through what right now? K through K through two. What is it that they're going to be doing next year? And how much is that going to take from us? 60 more students. 60 more students. And, and how much is that? Total 240. 240? So far. So far? That we know for a fact. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Now for the uh, managers, Pado Valley Association of Managers. No manager coming up here. <laughs> okay, how about Communication Workers of America? I've never seen them, probably not. Okay, now, <laughs> now we're gonna go to the 8.1, which is the annual Williams Report, and it's gonna be presented by Thomas Tatum, which he's the um, County Office of Education. He's the Williams coordinator there. Good evening, everyone, board members, Madam President, mm -hmm. Dr. Rodriguez, cabinet members. It's nice to be back here. I'm a retired uh, PVSD teacher and administrator, and I'm back representing the County Office of Ed to present the uh, as the Williams coordinator, <clears throat> and I'm going to present the uh, results of the Williams inspection this year. And I'll be brief. I just have to read every single one of these. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I, we conducted the Williams inspections as they have been gone, going on in the last 15 years, I think. It's, it's a new experience for me, and it was a wonderful experience for me because I got to be back in schools, and I've been away for about eight years, and it was just a real treat to be in all the schools. And there's, a, there, from my perspective, there was such a sense of vitality and newness and togetherness in the way the schools looked, and also in the way the the way the the, the, the administrators and teachers responded to our visit. Uh, it was really a pleasant experience to be back in the classroom. I just wanted to say that. 
The Williams Settlement legislation requires the county superintendent of schools to annually monitor and report on schools ranked in deciles one through three based upon the 2012 base API. The Santa Cruz County Superintendent of Schools and staff at the County Office of Ed uh, are responsible for determining if students have sufficient standard aligned instructional materials in four core subject areas, English language arts, mathematics, history, social science, and science, including science laboratory equipment in grades nine through 12, and as appropriate in foreign languages and health. Two, determining if there's any facility conditions that poses an emergency or urgent threat to health safety and the, pu and the pu of the pupils or staff. Three, determining if the school has provided accurate data on the annual school accountability report, the SARC. Four, ensuring that a uniform complaint process, the UCP policy is in use, that's that, the sign that you see in all the classrooms. The notices have to be posted in all classrooms in Spanish and in English. Determining if there are any teacher misassignments or teacher vacancies at these schools. This report presents the results of our visits and review at Pajaro Valley Unified School District for the period of August through October 2019. The following, uh, we, we visited 19 schools and they were all the, they were all the, um, the schools that get visited every year. Uh, Amesti, Ansoldo, Calabasas, Cesar Chavez, EA Hall, Freedom, H.A. Hyde, Hall District, Lakeview, Landmark, McQuitty, Minty White, Ohlone Elementary, Paro Middle, Paro Valley High, Radcliffe Elementary, Rolling Hills Middle, Starlight Elementary, and Watsonville High School. Each principal received the summary report plus the FIT, the FIT report, which is the report that describes what um, issues or difficulties were seen at the school's facilities. Uh, George Lopez is the director of the County Office of Ed Maintenance Operations Department and he accompanied me on those visits. He went off and visited the, the classrooms and I checked uh, the, the same ones I checked and he also visited some restrooms and it's a random visit to classrooms that we just select. Our findings for each area are as follows. Instructional materials. The team found that all students had access to sufficient instructional materials, including textbooks in the core subject areas, including science, laboratory materials at the secondary schools. All 19 schools reviewed for instructional materials, textbook sufficiency fully complied with the Williams Settlement. Uh, facility inspections. Utilizing the facilities inspection tool, the FIT, as developed by the Office of Public Schools Construction to determine if a school facility is in good repair, as defined by Education Code uh, 17002D and 1, and to rate the facility pursuant to EC Section 17002D and 2, a school facilities inspection was completed at each school site. Our visiting team reviewed the previous year's FIT reports, FIT reports, annual FIT reports submitted by the district and inspected restrooms, common areas, kitchen, multi-purpose facilities, and 25% of the school's classrooms. Five of the 19 schools were determined to be an exemplary repair. That's, that's an improvement over last year. 13 were in good repair, and one school scored fair. No schools pose an emergency or urgent threat to health and safety in, of the pupils or the staff. The Williams Settlement included language regarding the accuracy of data reported in the School Accountability Report Card, the SARC. The 2017 and 18 SARCs for each school are available on the PVUSD uh, website. In reviewing the 2017-18 reports, all 19 schools, SARCs, accurately reflect the findings of the Williams Committee members. The teacher assignments and misassignments. During our visit, the 2019-20 master schedule or teacher assignment listing was collected and has been submitted to the Santa Cruz County Office of Ed Human Resources Department. The Human Resources Department in PVUSD has worked collaboratively with the Santa Cruz County Office of Education to ensure that teachers are appropriately credentialed and placed in the correct teaching assignments. In 2018 and 19, there were 12 teacher misassignments at the start of the school year. All 12 of those misassignments were corrected within 30 calendar days. All classrooms must have the uniform complaint uh, classroom notice posted. The team found that 25% of the classrooms visited at each site had all current notices posted in both Spanish and English. And that is the formal report from the Williams uh, coordinator, that's me. Oh, right. And it was a very much of a treat for me to do that this year and I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you for coming to our schools. What? No, you, you we do. We have so, questions. Oh, questions. Yeah. No, is there, is, uh, there's no speakers, obviously. No, no. So board comments. Oh yeah, sorry about that. 
I noticed that one of our schools got a fair rating, and I'm wondering if you can speak to that about what what was um, what were some of the issues well, and problems there. I can't. I can. Well, all I can do is just uh, just re repeat the report. Um, I, I should have had that. There we go. Which school? Joe, do you remember what school it yes, was? Yes, I have. I have it right here. Lakeview. 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 Right. Yeah. I just I have to pull out the particular. Lakeview. We've got Lakeview. We've got it. So what was the you know, findings there? Um, my recollection tells me that it was uh, George uh, Lopez was the person that uh, completed this aspect of the report. And, and my recollection is that there was an electrical issue on a wall of one of the classrooms that he visited. But I'll tell you in a second when I pull out the Lakeview page. So specifically, it was deficiencies in classroom F3. That's it. And it was two areas, interior surfaces found to be deficient, and then in walkways, um, there was some housekeeping prep that, um, in Mino prep that was not done um, to proficiency. So there were two deficient areas. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Rodriguez. So and one classroom can have a couple of deficient areas and lead to a fair rating it on the can. ones. Yes. Okay. Um, so I'm guessing that we've made uh, efforts to to rectify this. Let uh, me speak to that. Issue. I, I received from uh, Leslie today the, the, um, the uh, just to kind of review. Almost all the items on that report have been. I'll, I'll read some of them. Okay. Oh, uh, tall bookshelf not anchored. Done. 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 Every item that I see on here has been addressed by the, the staff at the school or by uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Dominguez's Dominguez. Uh, department. Dominguez. That's great. I have a couple that were that were just it just indicates that they were they were informed about uh, a difficulty or a fire fire extinguisher not updated that sort of thing. So as far as I can see, you know, I'll I'll, I'll go I'll go over this carefully with my colleagues. When I go back, but things are looking pretty good. Okay. I have one further question. This is probably best answered by Dr. Colleen. There were like 13 teachers that were misaligned, or I don't know the ex misassigned. Um, can you talk a little bit about what that means and what, and apparently that's been rectified according to the report, but can you tell us a little bit more about that? If we can get yeah. a working micro yeah, microphone. I actually have a big mouth, big loud noise, so little. But we want you on the community TV feed, so in, ca in case the community cares to. You could come up to the podium. That's the alternative, I guess. Right. Just said to put it way down for her. <laughs> Thank you. As tall okay. as you are. <laughs> um, basically, are you with me, or should I stay here? I, I think so. Here. I think those were my two questions. Okay. So yeah. Um, so basically, when teachers are misassigned, it could be for a variety of reasons. But uh, the main, the the basic reason is that we have a uh, an individual in the classroom that does not have a, a credential to teach the class, nor a, an approved credential waiver to teach the class. In so the, in the past, that would be like an emergency credential. Yes, okay. but that the emergency credential, if it's approved, like a STIP, PIP, or uh, an intern, those are you know those don't uh, the interns don't go for the you know on the misassignment. Um, and when you have vacancies, and it's typically a classroom that would have a sub that doesn't have a credential, like if it's a science classroom, they would not have a science credential. So we, um, we've done better um, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in current years because we continue to recruit. Um, and we recruit early and we recruit often and we're pretty assertive. And there are a number of things that um, we work together with PVFT and, and thanks to the board um, that we do um, that's unique to our district. For example, the mentor MOU where we do give uh, teachers um, who have uh, a lot of experience, um, we give them a stipend to help our new teachers, especially those on STIPS, PIPS, and 
um, interns, you know, on those credential waivers. And we also have the, the typical, you know, NTP for our BITSA teachers. So there's a number of things that we do that is unique. Um, and, you know, thanks to the board for continuing to support that. And I think that's gone a long way in helping us. And we have also given signing bonuses. There's MOUs for teachers um, that want to pursue a credential in special ed and hard to fill positions um, and uh, like science and math. And we give them uh, tuition reimbursement for pursuing those kinds of things. And I think that's helped um, with regard to being able to address uh, the misassignments. But what I really, I mean, that's wonderful. Like mm -hmm. we, I pretty, I think we all know that stuff. But just in terms of this particular issue for Williams, mm -hmm. in plain language, we had 13 teachers that were misassigned. Mm -hmm. So what, what, what was that about? Like, and what happened to those teachers, how, how, or did they get reassigned to a more appropriate classroom, or did they get their credentials, they, or, or did we prove that they had? A special waiver, like, can you just plainly tell the Mo community what Most happened? of those, um, I don't have the specific teachers, but we can, we can um, you know, provide that information. But I would probably um, say that a lot of those were vacancies where we had substitute teachers in them until we were able to fill okay. them with a teacher who had a credential or a credential waiver. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Could you can talk in the microphone because we're on a no, community sorry. TV feed. I right could now. see when I uh, when I when I traveled around this inspection, I could see, there's a very familiar pattern where that does happen, and I, I saw that this year. What we just reported wasn't from this year; it was from the year before. Right. And I'm, I'm I can only assume that that will hopefully that will get corrected. Whatever issues existed this year will get corrected. I just get the data from the uh, HR teachers. department, the, the county office of Ed HR department. They do a pretty thorough job of checking credentials and right. doing all that. And basically, uh, all I have is their summary. Right. Okay. Any Thank other you. Questions? No. no. Thanks for waiting. Thank you. No okay. This one. Oh, no, we're, we're done with this one. We can do the next one. So um, we're now on eight point two, which is an important issue: the safe routes to school draft plan, which is presented by Amelia Conlin, transportation planner. Good evening, superintendent, board members, members of the public. Thank you for receiving this presentation tonight. My name is Amelia Conlin, and I'm a transportation planner with Ecology Action, here to present to you on the draft recommendations from the Safe Routes to Schools plan for both unincorporated county of Santa Cruz and the city of Watsonville. Do I tell you? Oh, I have it. I have it here. So we are, have been fortunate to be working on two Caltrans planning grants. Uh, for Safe Routes to Schools plans for 15 schools within the city of Watsonville, um, as well as six schools within unincorporated Santa Cruz County. So that's uh, Aptos, Rio Del Mar. And um, this plan covers those 15 schools and has the overall goal of identifying barriers to walking and biking at each of those schools and then developing a list of recommendations to improve access for students walking and biking to each of those schools. We kicked off this planning process about a year ago. Um, you may remember we are here presenting the beginning of the process, and we hosted three community meetings, um, two in Watsonville and one at Mar Vista Elementary in Aptos. We followed that up with walking audits at each of the 21 schools, and that was an opportunity to observe the morning drop-off and the traffic around each of the school sites and start the conversation about possible recommendations. After those recommendations were developed, we presented them back at a parent meeting at each of the school sites with the goal of hearing from school staff and parents on whether this, these were the right set of recommendations for their school. We're here before you tonight to present the draft recommendations and we'll come back before you in early 2020 to present the draft plan. And before we go any further, I just wanna say that there are a lot of recommendations in your packet tonight. Um, some of them are on city property, some of them are on county property, and some of them are on district property. The district is under no obligation to implement these recommendations. We know that funding is tight. Um, this is a big picture, long range vision for the future of transportation around schools. And this is meant to guide future projects and to be implemented as funding becomes available. So to back up a little bit, the trip to school in the morning is a small part of a student's day. 
um, but it's something that can really have a big impact. Walking and biking to school is a great way to build exercise into the daily routine, help improve student health. Um, it's also a great way to build student independence. And one of our big goals with this project is to reduce the congestion that we see around every school in the county, um, not just PBUSD schools. And if we can shift some of those car trips to walking and biking, we can help to improve air quality around schools, we can help reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and we can help make our neighborhoods safer. So I, I really want to emphasize that community input was the foundation of the Safe Routes to Schools plan. Uh, we had good participation at the public meetings. We received lots of comments from parents about the issues that they're having with getting to school. Um, and we made a point of talking to parents during the walking audits so that we can, we can hear more about the challenges that they face. We also handed out surveys to parents at each of these 21 schools, which provided another opportunity for them to give input. And I do want to highlight some of the early wins, some of the projects that have been happening over the course of the past year to improve student safety. Um, you may have seen the sidewalks that have recently been installed on East Lake uh, to provide access to Lakeview Middle School. That's a huge win. That's an amazing improvement for safety. And Caltrans is also planning to install a bridge over Coralitos Creek starting in 2022, which will provide a continuous pedestrian route to Lakeview Middle School. So that's very exciting. Um, I wanted to commend the district for a few of your parking lot improvement projects that have happened over the summer. Uh, the project at Freedom Elementary and at McQuitty, those are both great improvements to the school drop-off to increase efficiency and student safety. And then finally, I wanted to highlight the Green Lanes project that's being done by the city of Watsonville to install green lane striping on bike lanes throughout the city, starting with Bridge Street near Ann Soldo Elementary. So there are some great things happening now. And I wanted to let you know that the city of Watsonville is considering a couple of draft community goals through implementation of the Safe Routes to Schools plan. The first is to increase the number of students who are walking and biking to school by 5%. Um, Watsonville already does have tremendously high rates of students walking and biking, which is something to be celebrated. And so this is a goal for all of the school sites to increase by 5%. And then the city of Watsonville has also approved a Vision Zero policy, which has set a goal to eliminate traffic injuries and fatalities throughout the city. So that's a goal that they're working towards, um, and we see the Safe Routes to Schools plan is contributing to that. So we do not have time to go through all of the recommendations for each of the 21 schools, um, and I won't even try, but wanted to give you an overview of some of the common recommendations that are included in your packet. The first is curb extensions. And these are an extension of the sidewalk at the curb, uh, which help to make pedestrians more visible when they're waiting to cross. So rather than having to peek out from behind a parked car when you're waiting to cross the street, pedestrians are clearly visible to drivers. You'll see recommendations in your packet for safe routes to schools, <coughs> corridors, and connectors. And these are the primary streets that students are using to get to school that we've identified. And the recommendation is to use a menu of options for these streets to slow down traffic speeds and to improve the safety of intersections and crossings. Um, so we're looking to slow down traffic on these streets as much as possible um, and to make it safe to cross the street. We have recommendations for our RFBs, or Rectangular Rapid Flashing Beacons. These are pedestrian activated lights um, that are installed at uncontrolled crossings and help to highlight the pedestrians who are waiting to cross. We have recommendations for two-stage crosswalks or offset crosswalks. And this is a crosswalk with a jog in the middle um, that through its design basically forces a pedestrian to check for traffic before they enter the second leg of the intersection. We have recommendations for raised crosswalks, which are basically a speed hump with a crosswalk striped on top, help to elevate pedestrians, increase the visibility, and slow down traffic. And we have a few recommendations for protected bikeways, which have some kind of physical barrier between the bike lane and moving traffic. Um, throughout the country, we've seen that when there's some kind of barrier between people biking and moving traffic, people are much more likely to bike, um, feel much more comfortable doing so. So these are some of the types of recommendations that are included in the plan. And I did want to go in detail through the recommendations for one school, H.A. Hyde Elementary, to give you more of a sense of what we're talking about here. Um, this is a map of the recommendations. 
And as you may know, many H.A. Hyde students live on the north side of Freedom Boulevard and so need to cross to Freedom to get to school. And so the first recommendation, um, we've identified the crossing of Freedom at Clifford and Gardner as the safest crossing now, and so looking to make some more improvements there to improve the safety. And the first piece is to install high visibility crosswalks and a leading pedestrian interval. And this is a change in the signal timing that gives pedestrians a little head start when they're going through the intersection um, so that they should be in the middle of the intersection, clearly visible to drivers who may be making a turn. And the final piece here is to consider a no right turn on red at all approaches of this intersection um, to prevent any conflicts with right turning drivers and pedestrians in the crosswalk. The second recommendation here is for the crosswalk right in front of the school on Alta Vista, and that's to upgrade that crosswalk to a raised crosswalk, uh, to install a high visibility crosswalk across the school driveway, and to install curb extensions on either side of that crosswalk. And the third recommendation here is for a treatment similar to what was just implemented at McQuitty. Um, this is a pretty chaotic drop-off area. There's lots of double parking. Um, lots of students being let out in the street and needing to run across traffic to get to school. And so implementing a formal loading loop in front of the school with some kind of separation between the loading zone and the travel lane. And a conversation that's been going on for the school at the school for some time is the expansion of parking in the back of the school. And so we wanted to formalize that within this plan. The fourth recommendation here is for the intersection of Santa Clara and Alta Vista, and it's to install curb extensions on all four corners of the intersection and to stripe that fourth leg of the intersection with a high visibility crosswalk. And the fifth recommendation here is for Santa Clara, and it's to look at those Safe Routes to Schools corridors treatments that I was talking about, so looking for ways to slow down traffic on Santa Clara, and then looking at either expanding the sidewalk adjacent to the school or relocating some of the utility poles that are currently blocking portions of the sidewalk. So that gives you a sense of, of the details of what we're talking about for these schools. And so in addition to infrastructure recommendations, there are some non-infrastructure, some program recommendations. And I wanted to highlight a few of the recommendations that involve the district. Um, again, these are suggestions for you to consider. The first is for the district to approve a district-wide policy of support for active transportation. This is largely a symbolic gesture, just to say that walking and biking is a good thing um, and that we should be doing more of it. The second, you know, there are a variety of programs that are run by local nonprofits in the county public health department. They're coordinating with various school staff. Often that staff person is confused about the wealth of programs that are out there and, and who is contacting them about what. And so the recommendation is to designate um, a specific staff person at each school to be a Safe Routes to Schools contact. The third, and this is, this is a big picture idea, but for some of the school sites, we saw that the district boundaries required students who lived farther from their school to be bused to school or driven to school. And that's a relatively quick, that's a, I, I'm not going to say that's a simple fix, but <laughs> that's, that's something that can be done without infrastructure improvements. Um, and it's looking at the district boundaries and ensuring that students are attending the school closest to their home. And one thing we saw at a few schools was <clears throat> that a um, bus stop, say for the middle school, a bus stop near Radcliffe Elementary was picking up students right during the middle of the pickup or the drop off. So the school bus is in the midst of all the parent traffic. Um, it's getting stuck in the parent traffic or it's adding to the parent traffic. And so the recommendation is to move school bus stops perhaps around the corner, maybe a block away from other schools, um, or look at the timing so that the school bus is not impacting the school drop-off traffic in the morning. Mm -hmm. The third, um, next one I'll talk about here. We know this is a tough one. Um, we saw some amazing crossing guards at schools around the district, and we saw some schools who were having a really hard time attracting crossing guards. And the recommendation is that uh, find a way to have a crossing guard at each school before or after schools, and one of the options there could be to look at a volunteer program, 
to look at recent high school graduates who may not have found a path yet and may be looking for something to do. Um, find some creative ways to find people to fill those roles. And then finally, a small and simple thing, um, just ensuring that all parking lot signage is bilingual and understandable for everyone. So the next steps on this plan, um, we presented this to City Council last night and we anticipate bringing the final plan to City Council in early 2020. And the city is already looking ahead to possible grant funding sources and thinking about how to bring in money to implement some of the projects within this plan. So with that, I'll wrap up my presentation and I welcome any comments or feedback you have on any of the recommendations that are in your packet. Mm. The speaker. Yeah. So we have Murray Fontes. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Rodriguez, I'm Murray Fonts. I work with the city of Watsonville as a, in the public works department. And I would like to express appreciation for the collaboration that's gone on between the district and the city for one of the complete streets to school grants that Amelia just reported on, the one that involves 15 schools within the city limits. Unfortunately, Watsonville scores high when it comes to accidents involving pedestrians 15 years or younger. And one of the ways that we're trying to address this is to collaborate with those who can share our concerns. And so we've reached out to the school district and together we, with your support, we secured this grant, which, is, which has allowed us to draft this plan. The success of the plan has been largely because of the input of your staff as well as the volunteers and parents who made many suggestions. I would encourage you to pass on your suggestions as well so that the, comp so that the report can be as complete as possible. And then we would like to reach out to try and secure transportation funding. One of the rules of transportation funding is the golden rule. Those who have the gold make the rules. And one of the rules currently is collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. <laughs> so when the time comes for the city, when they identify grants that would support these kind of improvements, we will reach out to you once more and ask if, if not to partner to show support so that we might submit applications for the funding and if possible share in the development of those improvements. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Gina Cole. Thank you, uh, board. Appreciate your time today. My name is Gina Cole. I'm the director at Bike Santa Cruz County. Um, we do a lot of work with Ecology Action, and this is a fantastic report. They really did a, a, a a great job with the community outreach. I participated as a parent uh, at EA Hall with the maps and identifying places that where it was rough to get to school, hard for students to get to school. Um, I stood on the corners at Watsonville High and watched the way kids came to school, how the cars um, trans, you know, how the cars traveled to drop kids off, what that looked like at some of the different school sites. Um, I drug my kids down to EA Hall so that they could identify places where it was the sidewalk was hard to skateboard or hard to ride their bikes to, to schools. Um, this is a very well thought out, very well researched plan. Um, the, the recommendations that they've put forward for the schools will take, um, a, will take capital, that's all there is to it. And, and just to echo what Murray said, collaboration is key and I know you guys have an outstanding grant writer. Um, and so I'm sure that between all of the advocacy groups and Ecology Action and the school district, we'll be able to really come up with some great routes for our kids so that they feel safe, so that their parents, like, and I was one of those parents uh, driving my car, my car with one child out to Charter School of the Arts because she couldn't ride her bike out there by herself. 
Um, and so now that they're closer, they walk to school. Um, they, both my kids walk to Watsonville High, they walk home or skateboard home as well. And I'm appreciative of that. They whine, as kids will, but it's because it's a change for them. But I am really appreciative of the plan and the efforts that are, are put forth to keep our kids safer. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Oh, I know, yeah. So, so comments and now comments from the board. Hi, I just wanted to say thank you for all the work that you've been doing. I know Danny and I have had the privilege of attending a meeting and, um, you know, we have had a lot of concerns about crosswalks, especially with some of the schools. And I know the city of Watsonville has already started implementing some crosswalk changes um, that'll help keep kids safe, as well as some bike lanes that are already painted green and being used. Um, but you mentioned about encouraging kids also to walk or bike to school. Um, one of the issues is, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but in Watsonville, there's a lot of kids that don't know how to ride a bike. And so possibly in encouraging the kids to bike and walk to school, especially kids that are um, living long distances, is maybe looking at helping them learn to ride a bike safely. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, it was great. Um, I live in the Valencia area which is a really hard spot for kids. There's essentially no walkers except from Siesta at this point. Um, I know there are kids in the village and kids up Cathedral that would love to walk to school, but it's pretty dangerous. Um, I wanted to thank uh, Murray. Your last name is Fontes or Fonts? Fonts. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, we can't do it without partnerships because we just don't we don't have the the capital to do it but we're happy to collaborate and offer whatever we can when we can um, one of the questions I have is for our area you mentioned that where we have too many we have well one is too many but how many accidents have we had concerning kids under the age of 15 over and over what period of time because I don't think I know that information I mean I see in the media We've had a lot of adult pedestrian um, deaths and um, accidents between cars and pedestrians, but I'm not sure about how many children have been injured. Well, I've come up to say I don't know, but I can find out and yeah, let okay. you know that the accident data that is collected is released in a way that we're usually two years behind. But for a city the size of Watsonville, which is approximately 50,000 people, with comparable cities in the state of California, which are about 100, we've rated in the top five over the last five years. And the number of accidents has been between five and 10 a year. Wow. Okay, thanks. And if you happen to put your fingers on that data, um, our administration will We'll make sure we get it. But I appreciate you being here this late. I know it's it's a late night for everybody, so great um, report. And thank you to Gina Cole for all your advocacy um, with bikes. Yeah, I appreciate your, that you're here. Um, just real quick, I saw the presentation last night at the Watsonville City Council. Um, I thought it was great. Um, thank you, Amelia and Gina, for putting this together. I was there last year at E Hall. It was a great event with the maps. It it gave it put things into perspective. You know the way where the, all the population was, um, where what was needed the most. And um, do you still have that slide where it shows where the percentages of children that walk? Do you have that on you, or was that yesterday? I don't have that. Okay, that was added after this yeah. presentation. Was um, it, it shows that many white Watsonville E Hall and Radcliffe had some of the highest walking percentage rates. No, between 50, 55. Um, a, a lot of these recommendations, um, I was allowed to put input about Rodriguez, Walker, you know, very dangerous streets, no lights, um, but very dark. So I think that, you know, when it gets dark in the evening, children don't want to walk to school or walk home after. Yeah, um, 
children have always walked to Mini White Knee Hall. I always have, and so a lot of these recommendations on Lincoln are, are great, and so I just wanted to thank you guys on that, and hopefully we can put this together. Thank you. I'm just hoping, I mean, there's stuff that we could do that didn't, I, and I think I talked to Dr. Rodriguez about the, that there is some things that we can do that doesn't cost as much money that we can do to make sooner, to make, you know, things safer that are not as costly. <laughs> I think I talked to you about that even. Um, and, you know, the idea of seeing, I don't know if our grant writer can work on stuff like that. Is that a possibility? Yeah. And um, the grants that you could get as well, <laughs> we can share with each other in order to get some of these things done. Looking forward to that. Thank you. I actually had some questions. Um, sometimes she doesn't look down here. But um, I'm curious as to why there were only 21 schools involved when we have well over 30. Mm -hmm. Schools were chosen that are located within the urban services boundary. So within the city of Watsonville, it was all 15 public schools. And within the county, because unincorporated Santa Cruz County includes very rural areas like Bonnie Dune, Happy Valley, they selected the schools that are within the urban services boundary, which means that the schools are in more urban areas and there's more opportunities for students to walk and bike. So students in very rural areas, schools in very rural areas where there's less infrastructure and where students are living farther from school um, were not included in the plan. Well, I just, I think I find that very concerning um, that that's the reason for the basis of that decision as if somehow the balance of those other schools and the hundreds and hundreds of students that walk or ride bikes or commute however to those schools are not part of this factor as if they are somehow any less important, not as significant. I mean, that is definitely not an equitable situation. And this district has, and, and this board has been on a continuum of, you know, approaching equity for all of our students across the district. So that's very concerning for me that we have a significant number of our schools that are not having this address. And, um, and just also to add back onto what you said, Trustee Dodge Jr., um, I think H.A. Hyde, if I recollect correctly, is also an all walking school other than special ed, I think, right? I don't think we have bus service there. I don't think, yeah, so. It's a high walking school too as well, all right? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now we're going to do 8.4, which is a Measure L bond program update. And you know what I wanted to do? Because I kind of forgot to do this before when I should have, because uh, we're going to do a bus tour. <laughs> we're we're going to announce, we're going to do a bus tour of, of our Measure L. This year's bus tour taking place, it's going to be taking place on Wednesday, November 27th. From those of you that are still here, they could go from 9 a.m. to noon. And we will visit Aptos High, Mar Vista, Ohlone, Pajaro Middle, McQuitty, and Ann Soldo to see the wonderful upgrades to those school sites. So for those of you who are still here and you can come, that would be great. Sorry, I should have done it earlier. Thank you. Yeah. All right, Joe. Well, good evening, uh, Madam President, members of the board and administration, Dr. Rodriguez. Very excited to be here this evening. Um, uh, it really uh, captures our summer success in our Measure L bond program and making sure that we maximize our tax dollars and invest those dollars throughout our district and making sure that it's students first, student centered. Um, with me this evening, because I'm, it's uh, the work and the commitment, it, I'm not alone. We have a great team in our facilities uh, division and I'd like to introduce the team. We have Ryan, who is our senior project manager, uh, Pam Harnett, who is a project manager for our department, uh, Randy, uh, recently just joined the team as a planning specialist, Herlindo uh, also has just joined the team and then served as an interim basis as well, 
And then Connor, uh, as well, is a planning specialist who was instrumental with Aptos High School in the student quad. Unfortunately, he was unable to join us this evening for uh, a conflict with a family schedule. With that being said, I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to uh, Ryan and he'll um, and the team so they can outline the progress and the success that we had. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for allowing us to present tonight. Um, with that being said, quick agenda for what we're going to cover. We're going to start off with PV High Playfield update. We're going to cover all the different zones that we did construction over, uh, north, central, and south. Um, we're also going to go over the endowment projects and some non-bond bond fund projects. Um, we're going to then jump into the financial reports um, and show all the costs for the completed projects this year, as well as our remaining fund balance for our current bond. And then we'll give you some other updates, including the facilities bus tour and the facility master plan. Uh, with that being said, I'm going to hand it off to Pam. Hello. Hello. Um, I am managing the Pajaro Valley High School Playfields project. And um, I will skip to the second note due to we probably already know the first. Kent submitted final guaranteed maximum jam paper, the 12.8 plus million board approval contract with Kent Construction on March 13th. Now this proceeds Kent Construction on April 8th. Uh, construction phase of the Playfields project began on March uh, 27th, 2019. Can I, can I just say one thing? Yes. We're being recorded, and this is on community TV, so when you're rushing through it, I think our viewers aren't going to be able to understand okay. you very well. So if you could just enunciate very okay. clearly, I'm that would be great. Sorry. Thank, no, that's okay. Okay, so um, we are well underway with the Playfields project and um, rough grading and site retaining wall construction will continue into winter of 2019. Uh, the first top photo there on the right is a shot of the retaining walls from the driveway of the road. Um, and that is the second photo on the bottom is the um, is the vehicular driveway going in. But um, yes, we are well underway with the project. And there's lots of grading that has been already done. And it's primarily site, site work. And um, yeah, so we're doing well. You think? With uh, what we're, that we're looking part of it at least? some. We're looking at summer of 2020. Mm hmm. OK. Does all construction need to stop during the winter months? No. No, we, we can go through. Yeah, yeah they're going to winterize the, the project, so they'll still be able to get their trucks around. And um, the foundations of the, the buildings that are on the site should be able to continue. So yeah, they're still, we're, we're very hopeful to keep some construction going during the winter. OK, oh, sorry. So we've done a whole slew of different types of projects this summer, um, including perimeter safety fencing, uh, roofing and HVAC replacement, some site safety improvements, um, some play structure upgrades, some quad upgrades, um, flooring replacement and ADA uh, accessibility improvements. Um, in the north zone at Aptos High, we are still currently working on the structural repair and roofing replacement. Um, as well as we completed the shade structure and quad upgrades. Um, at Bradley, we installed a walking track, and we also did a admin upgrade at Mar Vista. And then I'd like to bring Randy up. Hello, board. My name is Randy Kennedy. Um, Today I'm talking to you about the central zone. So at first we have uh, PV High. We have the uh, track and field installation progress. Um, as well as the uh, science room renovation that uh, happened over the summer and uh, the new band room renovation that also occurred. Um, at Calabas, Calabasas Elementary, um, we have the exterior painting and drywall repair that uh, is uh, coming to completion. Um, at Ensold Elementary, we have the playground safety upgrades as well as the uh, exterior painting and drywall repair. And at uh, Freedom Elementary, we also have the uh, drop-off and site safety fencing project.
And then uh, at Lakeview Middle School, uh, we have the multi-use pavilion shade structure that's going to be going up um, over the winter break, um, as well as uh, a few ADA upgrades. Uh, Rolling Hills Elementary School, um, the NPR re-roofing and interior upgrades and uh, HVAC replacement is uh, the picture that you're actually seeing right there. We, um, we've done it. We did that. Yes, this is actually complete. Um, as well as uh, Starlight uh, Elementary School, uh, we're going to do uh, roofing. We've, we've already completed the roofing uh, improvement and dry rot repair as well there. Um, for our south zones, we have Lynn Scott Charter School. Um, we had the perimeter safety fencing and site improvements that have uh, taken place there, and that is the top right photo you're seeing, as well as the uh, McQuitty Elementary School perimeter safety fencing and site improvements, which is the bottom right picture. And uh, for our south zones, uh, Ohlone Elementary, uh, we did the perimeter safety fencing as well as site improvements. Um, that's going to be your bottom photo on the right. And then Pajaro Middle School, we uh, also tackled the perimeter safety fencing and site improvements. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm going to do the endowment fund summer projects. So what is your name? My name is Erlindo Fernandez. Erlindo. I've been with the district for 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to be covering the endowment fund summer projects. Um, Dort Harbor replacement at four sites. And Soldo Elementary School, Mar Vista Elementary School, Rio de Mar Elementary School, Valencia Elementary School. The flooring replacement phase six, Alianza Charter Schools, Amesti Elementary School, Calabasas School, E.A. Hall Middle School, Hall District Elementary School, Minty White Elementary School, Radcliffe Elementary School, Ohlone Elementary School, Watsonville High School. The picture you're looking at was uh, E.A. Hall, the hallway. Other non-bond summer projects, Prop 39, Energy Efficiency, HVAC upgrade uh, for charter schools and interior and exterior lighting upgrades. Those charter schools were Watsonville Charter School of the Arts, Alianza School, Lynn Scott, um, and Alianza. Child Development, Watsonville Charter Center, Flooring. Uh, replacement, new CBT and carpet, E.A. Hall Middle School, Prop 39 Charter, Navigator Char Charter Portable Restroom Building. Thank you. Uh, this is the total current expenditures that we spent over this last summer, a majority of them being our, our bond fund, 21. Um, total project cost was 29 million. 746,000, um, and of that, 28,371 was all bond fund projects. Um, the other <coughs> funding sources were child development and Prop 39, and that was 1.3 million. Um, this is a picture of our original Measure L bond allocations for each site, and this is our current um, funding that we have left. Um, altogether, we have 25745000 left. Um, and we'll also be celebrating and by doing a facilities um, bus tour um, November 27th um, from 9 to 1230, um, visiting these six sites. Um, and then we also are putting together our master facilities plan. Um, on September 25th, the board approved Maddie Architect Groups to start working on the master plan. Um, their scope of work includes um, assessment of our district properties. So that's to look at the age and condition of all of our current buildings and utilities. Um, our educational program needs assessment to make sure that we're using the classrooms, um, that we have the right size and the right configuration. Um, Integrating facilities master plan, that's looking at our basic needs, uh, such as water lines, lights, uh, restrooms, HVAC, and so on. Um, we're also going to be assessing a landscape. We're looking 
uh, forward to move towards low maintenance and drought tolerant plants. Um, we're also going to assess uh, all existing portables to get an updated inventory and check on all the current conditions of the portables. Um, we'll be doing a lot of community outreach and I'll talk more about that towards the end of this slide. Um, they'll be putting together an enrollment projection and demographic study which will look at uh, three-year and ten-year plans um, and they'll be doing a ton of coordination for all these steps with the district um, as well as providing a five-year deferred maintenance plan um, so that we can have a game plan in place to replace all of our aging and outdated utilities. Um, since then the facility department um, has sent all of our as-built and site plans to Maddie Architect Group. Uh, we held a kickoff meeting and we are coordinating uh, setting up community outreach sessions um, and with those sessions we plan to visit each site two to three times and hear from the community what their needs are for each site. Um, we plan to do this at the first or yeah, the first quarter of next year um, and all this is in order to produce a new and updated master facility plan so that we can go out to for a community bond November 2020. Uh, with that being said, are there any questions? I just wanted to clarify the um, facilities master plan was um, to align for state funding. Um, the state bond, uh, the state of California is going for a state bond in March, and so it aligns us to receive potentially matching funds from the state. And so the facilities master plan is a requirement to receive a state bond next year. Um, and then potentially at a future uh, timeline look internally uh, as a district when uh, if we pursue a future bond. Um, so just a point of clarification there. But uh, now we're open for questions um, from the board uh, for our team. I just wanted to ask you, um, I mean the bond, I don't know, future bonds hopefully. But um, so what have we done that will Explain to me again, what, will, what have we done already having our Measure L would help us get the matching funds for the state bond? Is that what you're saying? So we, uh, as a district, qualify for modernization funding. Uh, the state is going out for a new state bond. Yeah. Uh, so previous was Prop 51, but districts in California, um, as you know, there is a great need and it's competitive. So a lot of districts applied for Prop 51 and those fu funds are no longer available because they've been allocated. And so the state and Governor Newsom has um, committed in running a new state bond next year. And so once that state bond is, um, if it does pass, it opens up another uh, funding source for facilities, but districts to align to receive funding must complete a facilities master plan and a deferred maintenance plan. And so we're already in the process of doing that. Um, and then it also, it, it meets those two requirements, but then also the third uh, requirement is if we pursue a bond in the future as a district, we've already completed our facilities master plan to do that as well. But I was just, so there isn't, there isn't anything that makes us more qualified to get the, the state bond than in other places. I mean, the fact that we already have, we've already had measure L funding and that we're already working really hard to benefit all of our schools, could that help us with the fact that we, you know, we still need a little bit more money to complete the projects, would that help us with getting the state bond? I was just, state bond, was that sort of, I'm just asking if there's anything so, that qualifies us a little bit more than other places. So the requirement from the state is matching funds. So the remaining bond balance that we do have will assist us next year and the following year to match. And then it's gonna be allocated by site and um, but we have the ability to match those dollars with our current bond balance. So our current bond program does assist us in receiving f uh, state funding. Yeah, that's what I was yes. wondering, for sure. Yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for that presentation. Um, so I thought Governor Newsom had um, unlocked some money for this coming January to be, right, to be dispersed for the last bond. Correct. Right, because There's they only, they only, right? There was, how much, well, let, let's just start with how much was that state bond, the last one? 
the last one and let me pull it up. But there is a minimal amount remaining and that's what um, it's being allocated already. And then along with that is the um, the full day K um, funding, which we uh, submitted 17 applications to receive uh, funding. We did not, we were not one of the districts to receive that, but we are working on uh, submitting a new round of applications in January. So April 1st, is the new deadline for the full day K uh, grants uh, for school districts, and he's announced the re-establishment uh, of that funding. Um, so that's the a big portion of that. The original Prop 51 in 2016 was nine billion dollars, but I think not all nine billion was released. I think they released it in a little chunks. at a time, and I think there's a big chunk of it um, that he's releasing again in Jan this January. Right? I think that I've read that. Yeah, he, he released all the remaining nine million. He has released it. He has, okay. So I guess the next one is gonna be a fifteen billion dollar education construction bond. So that's one of the things I talked to John Laird about because we didn't get a piece of it even though apparently we had um, projects that had been submitted for um, reimbursement. Is that right? Correct. Um, go ahead. But we were um, or awarded three sites, uh, or no, I'm sorry, four uh, sites were awarded or four projects, mm -hmm. but the funding was not available. So we are now approved, and now for the new state bond, we will be one of the many districts that have their projects funded. So of the four projects, how much money are we talking about? Let me pull that up. And we are, it's a moving target because we are submitting. You can just ballpark it. Several I'm just applications. Curious. I would say a, a minimum of 20 million uh, okay. at least. Because I think when we sold the last bond to the public, you know, one of the things that we were hoping for was the matching dollars. We, that's one of the, the things that we were able to tell people is that we would get, try to match the money that we got from our local um, voters to state and federal dollars. Federal, there was never any federal match at all, even offered. And then um, with the state, we were hoping we would get that. Um, but you know, what's interesting to me is we did h hundreds of projects across this district. Why did we only submit for four for we, the reimbursement? We have submitted, we're ongoing, so we're submitting for more than. It's just we've been awarded four. Um, okay. from the state. So do we have some that are still pending or do we have the rest of them that were rejected? No, none of them have been on the modernization. None of them have been rejected. They're all pending. Okay, great. Well, that's good news. Yes. So I, I the only, know, sorry, so I wanted to make a correction. So it's 2.2 million for Aptos Junior, 1.4 for Valencia Elementary, 1.9 million for Pajaro Valley High School, and 1.8 million for H.A. Hyde. And I'm guessing with the Pajaro Valley project, we'll be submitting a much larger um, footprint, right? Because it's $12 million. But remember, the, it has to be for classroom. Yes, oh. it's regarding classrooms, uh, cafeteria, multi-purpose rooms, mm -hmm. et cetera. So it has to be um, more of the infrastructure and classroom facilities. Okay, got But it. we are um, compiling all of our science, uh, career tech ed modernization uh, projects throughout the district our um, SELPA modernization, so we're compiling all that and trying to uh, uh, lump imagine. all that together. So it wouldn't, and it wouldn't include auditoriums, you know, Pado Valley High School, auditoriums, would that be considered like a classroom? That's something we're also yeah. looking at as well. Yeah. It hasn't been built yet though, so. I know, but that's our next project. <laughs> okay, well, thank you for keeping your finger um, on the pulse of that because that will bring more money to our district so that we could do more facility maintenance and upgrade. Do. Thank you. Thank you. Danny. Uh, Danny. I just have a quick question. I'm not sure if it might be my laptop, but how come we weren't allowed to have that presentation? Or I'm not sure if it's my, I'm not sure if everyone else got it, the slide presentation. We uh, uploaded it um, earlier today. We were working on the final um, uh, items on several of the slides, but we, um, I think it was the pictures, the before and after pictures we're also working on. 
Uh, I, I think the, those numbers would have been important for me to read as well, I think for my colleagues too. So if we can get that next time, thank you. Okay. Um, I just want to um, thank you, Joe, for providing that clarification at the end of the presentation on, with your comment regarding to the statement being made that PBUSD is pursuing a bond on the November 2020 ballot um, because if that, the direction of that and the steps to move in that direction haven't been made by this governing body, then that's very presumptive of people to say because over the last few weeks, I have been getting inundated with phone calls about that. So there seems to be some sort of buzz out there in the community, but it hasn't been brought forth to this governing body, correct? To be for those steps? Correct. To start that. Right. So really that comment shouldn't be being made by anybody from this district until it, that happens. Okay, right. thank you for your clarification on that. You're welcome. I, I guess I'd like to echo that in that there are multiple things that are being planned now for upcoming ballots and depending on what if we're going to go out for a bond then the county needs to know that the city of Watsonville needs to know that because there are other taxes and parcel taxes and other things being proposed and everybody wants to know are we going out the answer that I got when I asked was no so this was came as a surprise to me tonight that we are going to potentially go out for a bond so are we or are we not? We are not going out for a bond. I do not believe it would pass. Okay. So I think we also need to see what happens with the, we need it desperately. So there's no, so it's not about the need. We need another bond to continue upgrading and maintaining our, our very uh, old infrastructure. Every, I think everybody here can agree on that. I'm concerned about the Cabrillo College bond is so large, it's what, 220 million they're going out for. I'm worried that that, that will put a damper on any bond that we try to um, push forward and get passed. So I, I am concerned yeah. about, about the outcome of, of all of the other bond measures, taxes and parcels, parcel taxes that are coming up. Yeah, there's a lot to consider and, and uh, uh, numerous uh, other measures. I know the city is going in March uh, for their local tax and then the 10 minute the discussion state, uh, as well. Um, and then numerous other measures that we don't know about it for November. But um, as the board has mentioned, there's a lot of preliminary work that still needs to go uh, if we were even to consider. But as of right now, we are not. You're welcome. I, I just like to piggyback on that since both you, Joe, as our CBO and the superintendent have now spoken to this and you've made the public statements here that with regards to the November 2020 ballot, PBUSD is not going forward with the bond. I understand you've made, both of you made those statements, but since, as I've stated, there's this buzz that we are, which is creating confusion for our community. If we could get, and I know we have a member of our press here tonight, but if we could get a formal statement, hopefully in the RP, to announce that, to just dispel that, just so, it just doesn't create any more added confusion to members of the community. So it's just crystal clear. Thank you. I need to, yeah. I'm gonna make a motion to extend our meeting to 11.30. We don't have to stay that long. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Now we're going to 9.1, approve EA Hall Middle School Sports Field Project Option C. And Joe Dominguez, again, CBO. All right, so. So pleased to announce um, uh, we had a very successful for EA Hall um, 
middle school, we had a, a very successful uh, community town hall meeting on, on the 27th of August. Uh, the community, parents, students, uh, faculty, both certificate and classified uh, were present and they were provided three options um, in alignment with their school priority list. And so um, we wanted to make sure that there was transparency of not only the, the budget uh, and remaining bond uh, dollars and balance, but also what we can get with those dollars. And so the staff, uh, in partnership with our architect, worked on uh, compiling and doing cost estimating, and so we came up with the, the various three options that align to their priority list and um, that was a very critical piece, is making sure that it was in alignment to the priority list. So first option was the uh, classroom renovation in the A wing, and that was only approximately uh, about 16 classrooms, and it was a modernization interior, uh, modernization of, those, of that area. The option B was a rubberized track with natural turf field, and then option C is a synthetic turf field uh, with a rectangular curb with no track. And um, overwhelmingly, we had 170 uh, community members uh, present at the town hall, and 159 voted for option C. And um, so overwhelmingly, we had full support, um, and we had opportunity for questions and answers and a group conversation. And I'd like to thank uh, David, our site uh, leadership, and our assistant, Sue, uh, Kristen, for her support. And we had a very successful uh, meeting. Um, after that, we took it uh, to the school site council. And our principal had a unanimous vote for option C from his school site council and his ELAC council. And then on October 30th, uh, our facility staff, uh, Ryan Block, and others uh, presented at the Citizens Bond Oversight Committee and overwhelmingly unanimous vote to approve option C in alignment to EA Hall's site priority list. So this evening we are following board policy and procedures and coming before the board this evening uh, for final approval to move forward with option C uh, so that our facilities team here this evening can meet with our uh, architect and move forward with the option C. Uh, one of the positive things with the field project is this is a project we will not have to wait for um, summer. We will implement as soon as possible. And so once board approved, we have a meeting actually tomorrow pending um, to look at the logistics. Our, I also like to commend uh, Mark Edwards and his team. They're actually last week working on prepping um, the current baseball fields. Um, and we're also look, we'll work with school site leadership because once we start, if board approved and we do start the synthetic, synthetic turf construction, then we need to have our, our students play in the baseball field area. So we need to make sure that's prepped and it's safe uh, to play on uh, while construction is going on because we're not gonna wait for summer. So, and that summarizes it. Um, we're very excited and I think the community and school site uh, and our students are very excited. So. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions? Okay, so no public speakers. <clears throat> Question from the board. I just make a, make a comment. Mm -hmm. um, this has been a long time in the making. You know, thank you to my predecessor who, who put this together. Um, this was this was his project. Um, so thank you, Michelle, Joe, um, the community members who showed up. Almost two hundred people at E Hall. It was it was a good site. Mm -hmm. Thank you, you know, trustees who helped me also get this along. So thank you guys very much. Thank you. Any other speakers from the board? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Joe, I wanted to ask, so what, um, did you get any sort of consensus as to why the option C over the option B with the track? I think um, the real want um, was the uh, safe play field for soccer um, for other uh, after-school programs and physical activities for the students, and, and that was the main piece was the play field. Um, we will do our best. Um, mentioning with the track on option B was a rubberized track, uh, similar to that you see at some high schools. Mm -hmm. So option C, we're probably gonna go with a non-rubberized track, but do like a walking track um, with like a hardscape, and we're gonna try to see what we can come up with to give the students um, some type of walking surface but the main 
request was to definitely have a play field, and uh, so we're excited to do that. Yeah, I could see that. I, I just, um, I mean, being an avid runner and having a family of avid runners that have been raised on that very track field, that's, you know, heartbreaking for me to see that the track may be going. Uh, if I could also answer, uh, I, yeah. a lot of people were concerned about losing the baseball fields, mm -hmm. and, you know, there's some portables right there, and some people were concerned because about Because of that expansion, yeah. yeah. So. Well, hopefully it works out that you can um, incorporate some sort of hard service track still around there. That would be great if that works out. And so you're saying that um, you, you don't have to wait till summer, but are you planning on doing this over winter months with the rain season or waiting until spring season? Uh, the winter, winter season will actually give our architect and the team to develop the plans. Okay. Uh, so it'll take about uh, anywhere six to nine, well, hopefully not nine months, but six months to process through the state and hopefully we and we're using um, preliminary plans that we had already so hopefully that'll save us time so we're going to use the winter to work with the state submit our plans and uh, hopefully we can get this in start spring and this was money that was allotted from measure l too correct isn't it yes it's measure right, l that's right. uh, allocated to ea hall right because i remember we hadn't spent that down there correct okay thank you you're welcome i know in previous meetings we've talked about like gopher issues. Is there less of a gopher issue with the, the synthetic turf than there is with the natural turf? There is less issues. So, so there's uh, less ongoing uh, maintenance and does, does that reduce overall cost long term? Correct. And, and we're also looking at uh, not only the gophers and maintenance but water right. on, and other costs. And so that was one of the key drivers that were prepping the baseball fields and uh, making sure that those are safe to play. So once we start construction. Just one more comment. I just, on the record, I, I understand synthetic fields because um, they're safer for rolling ankles, et cetera, than turf. However, I think for the environment, they're not great. And I, I think it would be better to have the rubberized track and the grass field with gopher protection. So anyway, mm -hmm. it's not up to me. It's already been decided. but. I don't. I really don't like synthetic fields. I don't think they're hygienic. I think they gas off. I think they're bad for the environment, and um, and that's how I feel about it. So thanks. Okay. And to back on what Trustee Deserpa said, they also need to be replaced. They don't have a, you know, infinite lifespan. So. Correct. They have to be maintained as well. Maintained as well, and uh, they. Uh, it's a. I don't know how to explain this, but a large vacuum type machine that needs to be treated and it also needs to have applied moisture, um, a mist or, or light sprinkle of, of water. So it does have treatment, but not as, um, and then the life expectancy depends on the, the materials and fabric that we use and the different vendors have different quality products. So it ranges from, I would say, uh, eight years up to 15 years, it, it just ranges. Maybe you could report back to us at a future date, just an update on that, even if it's in the backup, like on a B2B or something. That'd be yes. great. Thank you. And, and we will bring this back to the board uh, once, so as we do with our other projects, the award of the contract, uh, the price, timeline, all that uh, will be brought back to the board for approval as well. So we'll have an update as well. So just to, yeah. just to also um, echo Trustee Acosta and but I also mentioned that at the beginning. I was a supporter of A. But, you know, this has already been in, in effect for a long time. And, you know, 100, you know, almost 200 people at, at E Hall, I mean, that's what they said and that's what they said online. And so, yeah, thank you. Comments? No, that's it. No more comments. Okay, thank you, Joe. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> So all, um, do I have a motion? Do I have a motion? Make the, make the motion to accept item 9.1. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay, the next one is an action item 9.2. And this is what we've kind of done before. Um, the MOU with uh, PVSU and San Francisco State University's teaching program, intern replacements like we did last time, quite a few. <laughs> yes, this isn't a new item in terms of the topic, correct. So good evening, President Osmondson, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. 
The MOU in front of you is a renewal for our ability to hire interns from San Francisco State University, and um, we currently have one who is actually working through her internship. Um, and so we would appreciate an approval on this MOU to extend our MOU with San Francisco State for another three years. There you go. Okay, no comments, right? No comments. <laughs> you have a comment? Uh, no public interest. I have oh. comment. Okay. Just a, um, just, okay, I have a motion. Wait. He has a I just have a, just a quick question. Um, oh. Is there anything going on with the gear up program, UCSC? I mean, is there any interest from UCSC coming now? UCSC actually doesn't do internships with their okay. credentials because it's more of an intensive program and linked with the masters. They don't yeah. offer it. Okay. Yeah. okay, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> okay. I wish they did. <laughs> it's another pool, but no, they don't. Oh, that would be great I if know. they did. I For know. us, so close. I know. Okay. Do I have a motion? Move to approve. Second. Second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay. Nine point three, we're gonna approve um, hydration statement station for Ann Soldo Elementary, Freedom Elementary, H. A. Hyde Elementary, and Pottle Valley High School. I mean kind of wish, you know, because of all the Ohlone issues we could give them a hydration statement, but I know they're not in the city. <laughs> All right, thanks. All right. Uh, report represented by Dan Weiser, Director of Technology. Oh, Weiser, no, you're here instead. Okay, give us just, your name. Give me. us your name. Um, <laughs> good evening. Uh, I'm Rich Ariano. I'm the Director, Rich of, per director of Purchasing. Yeah, okay. Um, I don't know what, <laughs> whoops, wrong name here. <laughs> that's okay. I've been called worse. Um, so um, tonight, we'll be asking for your approval of the agreements to accept a donation of bottle filling stations for five of our sites. Um, the stations are going to be donated by Tap Water Watch. And Tap Water Watch has partnered with the City of Watsonville and their Plastic Free Watsonville Initiative. Um, and between them, they identified Pajaro Valley Unified as um, a great recipient of, of those stations. So um, the start of this, um, we have five sites that would receive a total of seven stations. And they're listed out uh, Pajaro Valley High School, H.A. Hyde, and Soldo, Freedom, and Watsonville High School. Um, so that would take up seven of the ten that we are allotted. Um, the sites were determined by our m and and facility staff as having the best infrastructure, um, so taking into consideration the available plumbing, electrical, wall materials that need to be accessed to install them. Um, we found these sites as the ones that um, would allow our staff to install them and we wouldn't have to contract out for the services. Um, the stations themselves are LK Easy H2O stations and they'll provide chilled and filtered water through either a bottle filler or um, a regular water fountain. And then they also have a, a feature to keep track of how many 20 ounce bottles they've kept out of um, our kids' hands and out of the trash. So um, if there's any questions you have about the stations, I hope I have the answers for them, but. Um, I just have one. Sure. Um, do you know you or, or Dr. Rodriguez, does this come also with offering, because um, trust, President Trustee Osmondson and I had had a discussion with this, uh, with the superintendent about the um, stainless steel bottles, the reusable, will they be coming with that? Or is it possible for us, we talked about seeing if we could get our grant writer to write a grant for that so we could continue to try to create that equity across the board for our students. So do either, or either one of you able to answer about that? So the group that has come to us in terms of Ohlone has connected us, they actually just emailed me today, um, connected us up with a group who is willing to help um, sponsor a grant for that. For the um, bottles? For, just the, for the- Stainless um, steel? Yep. Okay. So we will, um, they, just, uh, they just provided us the link today, so we'll make sure and apply. But and it's not coming with these water it's stations. It's not coming with these okay. water stations at this time, but we are, um, we are progressively moving forward on that. Okay, great. Thank you. <coughs> so we're approving this too. Can I have a motion? I make a motion to approve. I second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? So when will one, these two, be um, put in by? I had one final question. 
Um, so I will place the order with Tap Water Watch tomorrow. They should arrive within 10 days. Um, wow. Installation? Because installation has been a bug in the past. We've had a lot of these waiting to be installed. So when can we expect installation? Um, so the first one that is scheduled is Calabasas. And we have that over Thanksgiving break uh, scheduled. And we're using internal staff. And so we, uh, Herlindo from our facilities team is now the point lead and has done an assessment with our electrical and plumbing team. And so they find they have found locations at the sites that uh, match the infrastructure, electrical and plumbing. And so we work with Calabasas to confirm two locations there. And so that's what we're That's great, on. thank you. You're welcome. And the other ones are gonna be soon after. And the other ones will be soon after and we're phasing <laughs> those in uh, but we'd like to complete them uh, by the first of the year. Oh, that's soon. Pretty good. That's pretty good, isn't it, Kim? <laughs> okay. Um, so we voted on that already, didn't we? Yeah. Okay. Um, now is the consent agenda. I'd like to move to approve the consent agenda with moving item 10.13, 10.14, 10.16 to deferred consent. 10 points, say that again. One, three, one, four, and one, six. One, four, and one, six. I have okay. an item I'd like to move to 10.7. I'll amend my motion to um, include 10.7. Thank you. Second. Okay, thank I would just like to acknowledge La Rosa Tortilla Factory, De La Colmena, and Starbucks on Freedom. And this is for the generous donations for pastry, water, milk, and coffee for a state of the district breakfast event. Thank you, all of these places, for giving us all, well, you know, these food places. They're all food places, mostly, and coffee places. So thank you for helping us for the state of the district breakfast. Thank you, all these organizations and places. Okay, um, mm -hmm. we're, 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 yeah, we're going to have a motion and a second, and then we're going to do the, well, did we already do the? We didn't vote on the remaining items. Yeah. Okay, okay, so we're going to call for a vote on the remaining items, then we're going to go defer to dissent. Okay, all those in favor for all the remaining items? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay, so we're starting with 10.3. Seven. Oh, 10 point. You just did 10.3. Okay. Oh, yeah, obviously. Okay, so are, and we're not going to do 10.4? Um, she, she said 10.1 for the Oh, 10.3, 10.13. Oh. So we're on 10.7 right now. Yes. Okay, well, I'm confused here. Sorry about that. She pulled. 10, 13, 10, 14, 10, 15. 10, 13, 10, 14, and 10, 15? 16. So we're already pre-corrected. Okay, 10.7. So uh, do people, can, uh, you can talk about that. Yeah, thank you, Louise. <laughs> if you have a question. Yeah, I just wanted to ask a question. Because I have a question about the consent agenda. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to ask a question, Louise, um, especially after having seen the Make Lab in action. Um, are the, the mostly the students from the Make Lab going to be able to go, or are you pulling? From? We we do invite the uh, similar uh, the or the first session the the winter one. It, it'll be uh, girls, the ladies uh, for for middle school girls. Uh, we invite about twenty to twenty five ladies from from all the middle schools. Um, and some of them will be uh, some of the same uh, students that did participate on the Make Academy. Okay. Uh, for the assignment, it will be the uh, boys, and it will be between 20 and 35 boys. And some of those uh, uh, students that did participate on the Make Academy will be there as well. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. That's all I wanted to know. <laughs> uh, yeah, I saw that program. It was a great program. I never knew it existed. You know, maybe down the road, if you know, the, the teacher or whoever heads the program can show us what they do yeah i did talk to uh, patricia about the possibility of presenting to the board and she's more than willing yeah. to come and present some of the programs that she's actually running yeah I, I the only reason why i found it is i walked in on accident and i'm not sure if mr chase the shocker walked in on accident either so 
Oh, okay. <laughs> I wasn't invited. I walked on an accident. But um, thank you. I think we invited everybody that walked right through there. Everybody yes, invited, yes. Yeah. yeah. That's a great program. Thank you. Yes, I make a motion to approve item 10.7. Second. All those in favor? Aye. I, I could clump my questions. They're very similar. So I could clump my questions for them all together. And I think, would I be directing these to you, Joe, right? Yes. Um, so I just wanted to, um, you know, this has been an, sort of an ongoing issue. It was an ongoing issue with the past board with concerns from the previous board being concerned about the number of change orders that we see. Um, it's been addressed by this new governing board as well over this past year. So ask the question again why are we having so many change orders and the one 10.116 it's the second time we're having a change order on it um for 1013 uh unforeseen conditions um as we know some of our sites are uh, older and so we have our architectural plans and then we have what are called as built uh plans which are marked up by our staff that have plumbing electrical lines and that is as good as uh, how we upkeep them so those could be 20 years 30 years old um, and in this case from equity we uncovered electrical or plumbing lines that were not in those plans and so that's what the change order one of the main change orders in 10.13 and then one of the other items that we uh, did to the benefit uh, of McQuitty was the parent uh, drop-off area so we had to change the cement uh, slope or ADA accessibility. So actually, that was that. a it was a I want to say a, it was a, a district request change order so that it had more benefit to the school site. And, and so it wasn't this was just not something we foresaw that we wanted to do before that. And the preliminary uh, planning it was not included. Mm -hmm. And once we realized it could be accomplished with the setback, and we had to meet with the city on the setback requirements so at first we thought we did not have the clearance but once we realized we did have the clearance then we moved forward and i um and the site was pretty happy and then 1016 for pv high uh the main uh change order there was when we removed the uh portables um what was not in the plans was a um a plastic uh lining uh, that was about two feet in the ground that was like a honeycomb mesh uh, that held the slope together so that wasn't something that we reviewed so that was it was there and, and it, it was there to be removed and so when we dug with the backhoe and the the, um, the construction equipment when they dug it out they realized that there was a material down there so that was an unforeseen condition and um, and so that was a, a part of it and the other component of that is if you recall um, the portables, uh, one other piece that was captured was enhancing the band room uh, at PV High. So that work was captured within the scope of the work because we eliminated those portables. So we had to make space in another classroom. And so that's part of this change order as well. And so are these changes coming out of the Measure L? Yes. All and of it, them exclusively are coming from Measure L? It's coming out of Measure L and it's within the uh, percentage and budgeted amount for the project. Okay, and, and it's just, you know, because even with the previous director for maintenance and his previous assistant, I mean, that was the, ex you know, the same excuse we got. We, we understand that, yes, we have a lot of very, very old aging buildings with aging pipes and electrical underneath, but, I mean, these contractors, if they know they're dealing with buildings that are 30, 40 years old, I mean, is there really no way on their end to foresee some of these probabilities that these things come up? It's the review on the planning side, um, but I think, uh, commend the team, we're under 10%. I think one was at 8%. Um, and then the change orders themselves, we have a contingency uh, fund based by the project site mm -hmm. so that little contingency fund that we have on the project is used to offset the change orders and whether they and some change orders are district requested and others are surprises that we come along in construction um, but we are um, I think 
doing more due diligence and I think one of the pieces that we've done recently and I appreciate the board's support is we increased our pool of architects so it's making sure that we have a quality pool of architects that partner with the district to not only design but also review the plans with the contractors um, yeah. and I think um, you'll see other projects that um, I believe there was one um, on the agenda that had no change orders and so we're trying to work very hard to make sure we continue that yes and we've had change orders in the past that have worked to our benefit so I do recognize that but just wanted to address it so unless any of my other colleagues have any questions I'll make a motion to approve 10.13 second those in favor aye, aye. Okay, 10 point. I'll make a motion to approve 10.14. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 10.16. I'll make a motion to approve item 10.16. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. So it's been one, two, three, four, five, six, zero, one for all of them. Okay. Um, we're we're going to do closed session. Um, somebody can talk about the, is, do you I, want I, to talk about the? I got the expulsion one. Expulsion, okay. So it's my first time doing an expulsion one. It, with a recommendation of district administration, um, student number 19-2099, uh, it's recommended that suspend, suspend an expulsion from the remainder of the 2019-2020 school year with placement at another school in the district on a beha strict behavior contract. Can I have a motion? Oh, we already did it. Yeah. Oh, excuse me. No, we already did oh, it. Oh, sorry. Yeah, we already did it. Yeah, no, I, I used, we used to always do it. We always used to do it out here. Okay. And it was a session. unanimous vote, so. Yeah, close, okay, the rest of a closed session. Okay, so motion number one, closed session item 2.2. .2. I move to approve the certificated personal report as presented by district administration on November 13, 2019 with seven and eight additional action items. A motion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion Six. number two. Six closed zero session. One. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Closed session item 2.3. I move to approve the classified personnel report as presented by district administration on November 13th with 10 and three additional action items. Okay, second. Aye. Second. Or second. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Is there anything else? Okay. Um, our next meeting will be on December 11th here in the district board room. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>